All right, we are going to go ahead and call the Tempe City Council work study session to order for Thursday, June 4th, uh, 2020. Um, due to the COVID concerns, uh, COVID-19 exposure, the city of Tempe has implemented measures to protect our community, including uh, the closing of the uh, council chambers and limiting the public attendance to electronic means only. Members of the public may review the live meeting proceedings on Tempe Channel 11, attend the meeting virtually through Cisco WebEx events uh, by visiting www.tempe.gov slash clerk. For more information or submit written comments to the city of Tempe's uh, speaker comment card on tempe.gov slash clerk. We are all participating via virtual, if you can't tell. Thank you all for attending. Um, if that, with that, we're going to head move into the first item on the agenda is our call to the audience for the issue review session items. Audience members have up to three minutes to address the city council. I will look, not look, I will ask our city clerk if there's any public comment cards. Mayor, this is Carla, city clerk. I do have one comment card related to item 2C. Okay. We read into the record and we have two speakers who requested to speak. Okay, read Which the first statement and then the, for the speakers that have joined us, if, when it is your turn to speak, if you could please um, state your name and place of residence for the record. All right, Carla. Okay, item to be read into the record from Christian Doak, Tempe resident. She writes, I am a cyclist. I quite literally bike everywhere I go and I have not driven a car in approximately two years. Early this year, after I broke my collarbone in a crash with a vehicle illegally parked in a bike lane, I began using a recumbent trike at my surgeon's suggestion. The experience I have had in the last few months of riding a recumbent trike, which is substantially lower to the ground than a regular bicycle, has reinforced my belief that we need to do too much more to provide protection to our most vulnerable road users. I regularly am passed by motorists at high speed with less than the legally required three feet of clearance. And I've had numerous close calls where an oblivious driver attempted to merge into me. Any of these things would have been worrying on a regular bicycle, but on a recumbent trike, they become truly terrifying as my head is barely above wheel height of most of the cars on the road. Whenever I am on a road that does not have a bike lane, which is a regular occurrence in the city, I have a persistently nagging worry that some driver who isn't paying attention will crash into me from behind, likely decapitating me. Reducing the speed limit on all of our major arterial streets, as proposed in Alternative A, is a great first step in making our streets safer for all road users, though it does need to be followed by additional changes. Significant research shows that drivers will go at the speed they feel comfortable going, regardless of what the posted limit is. Therefore, we should also repaint the lanes on the road so that they're more narrow and look at lane reductions in places where it is appropriate. In the, sorry about that. To sum it up, I would like to thank the council for its commitment to Vision Zero, and I think that commitment would be best served by adopting Alternative A as proposed by city staff. Our two speakers next in queue is Jim Delton and then John Kristoff. All right, Jim, this is Mayor Mitchell. You're up. Jim, are you there? Hello? Yes, Jim. Yeah, can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Okay. Well, good evening. My name's Jim Dalton, and I reside at 8630 South Holbrook. I'm a longtime Tempe resident. I'm now retired. I worked 40 years in the transportation field as a professional engineer. I've previously served on the Tempe Code Compliance Committee, the Police Review Board, and the Development Review Committee. And on this item of lowering the speed limits, I urge you to vote no. Tempe says it's data driven, so why don't we look at the data? The data Tempe presented to support the change consists of really only one item that's actually data. That was accident data in, in the city's presentation at their informational meetings. They showed a bunch of numbers on the screen, but they really didn't discuss them. They just said, here's accident data. So I looked at this accident data in detail, 
And I sent my review to the city traffic engineer and the city traffic engineer agreed with what I, I felt the data was showing. And what the data shows is there's only been one pedestrian accident in the past seven years in Tempe where the driver was at fault and the cause was speed too fast. There's simply nothing in the data that supports the idea that pedestrians have any significant risk in Tempe due to speeding cars. In nearly all the pedestrian accidents, there was no driver wrongdoing of any kind, speeding or otherwise. In fact, the fault for nearly every pedestrian accident was the pedestrian. That's what Tempe's data shows. And if you wanna make pedestrians safer, you need to do something about the pedestrians. The other reason given in Tempe for this proposal to lower speed limits is that it will be less harmful to pedestrians. And if you look at the physics, that's true. What isn't true is that what you're proposing is actually gonna result in lower speeds. It's not gonna make any difference in speeds. There's decades of engineering studies that have shown arbitrarily lowering speed limits below the 85th percentile do not change speeds in any meaningful way. The most you can hope for is maybe a 1% or a one mile per hour reduction. If you've driven Tempe streets, you know the drivers currently drive pretty much at the speed limit and obviously some drive over it and some drive lower it. And that's what you'd expect. This is what it's saying. Okay, one if the, step. If the speed limits were properly set. In addition, engineering studies have shown reductions significantly below the 82% though. Often cause an increase in Yes, I can see you now. Okay. Keeps coming up. Cannot join session. And the registration ID has already been used. If you're trying to rejoin, Jennifer, session, Jennifer, you're on, you're you're live. Jennifer, mute okay. yourself if you can. I've done that and I pressed OK. Okay, press OK real quick. Am I still on here? Um, yeah, Jim, hang on. We're having some technical difficulties. If you can't for a second. Okay. And then let's go ahead and close the app. So ahead and swipe up and close so the app. Just bring it back up again. You're live. Can you see it? Okay. Yes, Jennifer. I do. Now click on join. Sorry, Jim. Hang on a second. Okay. See, that's what keeps coming up. Oh, shoot. Okay. Um, I'm going to have hey, hang on. some One call second, your phone, Jennifer. Okay. Okay. And then you can at least call in. Okay. Okay. All right. At least it's in. Okay. All right. Are other people having trouble or not? Just me? It's only you and Robin right now that's having problems. And I don't know why. Okay. Elizabeth's calling me. Give me one sec, okay? Okay, okay, okay bye. Okay, bye. Hey, Elizabeth. Oh. All right. Thank you, uh, Alex, for your great technical uh, assistance. And Jennifer, I... I believe you're on, Jen. Okay, am I still there? Yeah, Jim, hang on one second. Jennifer, are you on? Tempe Council background looks different than it used to. Yeah, that's my back patio door. <laughs> <laughs> but it's nice. Oh, thank you. Um, hang on one second. Thanks, Jim, for hanging on. Just give us a second. We're having sure. technical difficulties. It makes us all seem more human. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna to need to continue because we have a couple guests that will be speaking with us that have limited time, so. Um, Jimmy, do you, you need to finish up? Yeah, I'll try and go through it as quick as I can. Um, okay, thank you. 
So if you're driven Tempe streets, you know currently the drivers drive pretty much the speed limit. That's what you'd expect. The limits have been set by the 85th percentile rule. We know from other studies that if you don't follow the 85th percentile rule, you get a differential speed effect. You lower the speed limit and some people go slower, which is what you were hoping. Unfortunately, most people don't. They continue to go the 85th percentile speed. Many studies have shown lowering speed limits that are not appropriately engineered to be lower actually increases accidents. So very likely if you go through this proposal, you're gonna actually have more accidents in Tempe. There's also a negative economic effect. And using Tempe's data, we can come up with that number. Tempe's traffic engineer said it would add 48 seconds if you implement this proposal. Using Tempe's traffic data counts and a $15 an hour wage, this proposed change in speed limits would cost nearly $17 million a year in lost productivity. The extra time spent driving because of those 48 seconds over all the people in Tempe who drive exceeds 1.1 million people hours a year, which is equivalent to wasting 1.6 lifetimes each year. So what I'm getting at in this is this is not a one variable problem. It's nice to say we can make some one thing better. We're gonna make several other things worse. And so Tempe is trying to solve a problem that the data shows doesn't exist in the process are gonna create new problems, which is gonna be widespread citizen disregard of speed limits, greater danger of speed differentials, and kind of a distrust in the judgment of Tempe leaders. Um, I went through all the comments on this and the comments are two to one against your proposal, two to one. And the only thing I saw in what you presented was you had option A, the original proposal, and then you got a couple more. I'm certainly in favor of changing the school speed limits. So that's not 24 hours and then they probably should be lower than 35 miles an hour. And I certainly would be in favor of targeted changes in the speed limits at, at appropriate places around Tempe, you know, downtown mill, uh, some other areas with high traffic where it makes sense. I'm, but I'm against, what's being proposed this is general lower everything it makes no sense and it's actually probably going to be counterproductive thank you for your time i can't hear you mark sorry my apologies i want to check with our city clerk thank you jim for your comments thank you i just want to check to see if everyone on the council now is on the phone carla Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. And then the next speaker, uh, is it David? It's not Please. Christoph. No. Who, who's the next speaker? John Christoph. John Christoph. Okay. John, can you please state your name and, and place a residence for the record, please? John, are you with us? All right, uh, Carla, is there any other speakers? Try him one more time. John Christoph. Mic check, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, splendid. Um, yes. The written comment for the record, but I also wanted to uh, throw in my uh, oral testimony as well, just in case there was somebody like the previous commenter, because the previous commenter illustrates very nicely the point that I wanted to make. So for the record, uh, I live on uh, McClintock and Apache Boulevard. I serve on the Tempe Transportation Commission, and I'm grateful to the Mayor and Council for the appointment of that position. And I've spoken with uh, pretty much all the council members uh, individually about transportation and other issues affecting our city over the you know few years that I've lived here. So we received 233 pieces of individual feedback from the city and the Transportation Commission got to review every single one of them. And first of all, the previous commenter is incorrect about the two to one ratio. It's more like a 60-40 ratio. But the other thing is that having read through every single one of those comments myself and tabulated them and grouped them based on the things that they were presenting, Every single one of the comments opposed to reducing speed limits is, I'm sorry, Mark, are you trying to tell me something? 
Okay, sorry, your mic is muted. Anyway, every single one of these comments that is opposed to reducing speed limits is either ignoring the data that the city staff have presented with us or is intentionally misleading about what the data says. So for example, the previous uh, commenter has told us that there's only one crash that was the fault of the pedestrian. That is blatantly not true. Arizona as a state is one of the most dangerous states to be a pedestrian and has consistently had one of the highest rates of pedestrian fatalities of any state in the United States for decades. And that problem extends not only to Tempe, but also to Phoenix, Mesa, Scottsdale, and all the other Valley cities. Furthermore, the reason why we assign blame to pedestrians and not motorists is because we have designed our street system specifically to be hostile to pedestrians. I do not think we should blame a pedestrian for attempting to cross the street as best they can when we don't have crosswalks for more than a mile on some of our arterials. I furthermore don't think that we should blame pedestrians for not being able to cross the street in the timely manner they are provided with not enough seconds on a clock to get across six lanes of traffic on one of our arterials. The other thing that our commenter has right is that differential speeds will occur unless you use the 85th percentile speed limit without engineering changes. What they're ignoring is that the city's plan specifically does include engineering changes, which have been demonstrated not just in Arizona, but in cities across the U.S. and across the world, in fact to specifically lower the speeds at which drivers uh, travel. We're talking about things like- John, you're gonna have to wrap signals. up. Time. John, you're gonna have to wrap up yep. your time. Almost, is okay, it? sure. Well, the previous comment went well over time as well, so. Um, well, because we- At any rate, we had... yeah, I'm wrapping up. At any rate, the point is that we are considering measures at a city level that will make these changes safely and efficiently, and we should not be designing a transportation system specifically for motorists who feel entitled to drive as fast as they can with no regard to anyone else. We specifically approved option A on the Transportation Commission because of the data-driven policy making that we want to see the city make, and we encourage the council to do so as well when it comes time for you to vote on this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Carla, do you have any other comments from the public? Carla? That's negative, Mayor. No additional comments. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're going to close that portion of the public comment period, and now we're going to move on to item number two for the issue review session. I'd like to call uh, uh, Chris Camacho, or he is the Chief Executive Officer of the Greater Phoenix Economic Council. Uh, he's going to make a, little, a quick uh, presentation, um, and is is really regarding the COVID nineteen related efforts by GPEC as well as Arizona State University and. Chris, we're very lucky to have you, and, and thank you for your friendship, as well as your partnership. If you're there, Chris. There we go. Mayor, can you hear me? Yeah, did you hear me at all? Okay. No. Yeah, no, I, I heard the intro. Thank you very okay. much. Sorry, Thanks, I, was on, I was mute. Muted. So I, I do have a, um, a bit of a, a deck if I don't know if the team can pull that up, but I did have some visual uh, illustrations that I think will further kind of reinforce the COVID related uh, economic activity impact as well as directionally where we're going in support of uh, the city of Tempe. So if, if I, we'll try I, to pull that up, but yeah, I think the, you have a deck. So here it comes. Okay, perfect. So I just have uh, mayor and council. Thanks again for the, uh, the opportunity this evening. I'll be very brief, but uh, I just want to express our great partnership we've had with Donna Kennedy and the team of uh, supporting your interest in driving high wage base industry uh, jobs and technology jobs, as well as manufacturing and other particular uses to the city of Tempe. We've, we've been a, an organization for the last 30 years doing our best to bring again, high wage jobs to the region. So what I want to talk about just briefly tonight uh, with the time I have is uh, what's going on in the, the, the world related to uh, COVID, the economic impacts, and, and certainly we're dealing with uh, an additional uh, you know, challenging item with the social unrest related to uh, the tragedy that occurred in Minneapolis this past week. So what we're, what we're particularly focusing on is, uh, sorry, I'm in a hotel lobby right now because I'm doing a pitch for, with a client that's actually looking at Tempe, the irony uh, that exists currently. But so if it gets a little loud, Mayor, just wave your hands and I'll do my best to step away. That's good though, so, it's Carmen. 
<laughs> That's right. So uh, first is uh, on, on slide three, if you go ahead and advance, we've been working on a regional acceleration plan, uh, recognizing that there's varying degrees of, of economists that have differing views on what's not only taking place currently, but, but also uh, what we're likely to expect in the recovery period. So what you see on uh, the left-hand side here is a, is a reference to the, the COVID outbreak itself. And, you know, how will we handle uh, the, you know, we've seen obviously increase in numbers over the last week of, of confirmed cases and, and so on. Uh, this axis up to my left side, you will see, you know, B1, 2, and 3, which references really how we're handling uh, the overarching response. And, and then on the right hand kind of X axis is the interventions, how we've been effective in the intervention aspect. And so what most economists believe in between A1, A3, and B4, which is referenced on the slide here, uh, you know, the, the reality is I, I think most believe that the V-shaped recovery is unlikely and, and that we're moving more towards an A1 or an, a Nike swoosh kind of recovery, which would be immediate downturn, pretty massive job loss due to the stay at home orders, and then a shift uh, you know, back to a recovery mechanism once we're able to reopen the economy as we have since mid-May. Uh, but some concern that still persists is how long will we stay in the trough? So the trough is the bottom of the arc on A1 and there's still a lot of question remains as to whether we'll still see slow and steady recovery or will we see B4, which is kind of a bump along the bottom uh, in a W-shaped kind of recovery. And so, again, there's differing views on this, but I, I like this visual to get uh, you know, out to the public on what we're seeing. And I'll talk a little bit about Arizona and Greater Phoenix and Tempe here in a second, because I do think there's some silver lining for all of us in this. So go ahead and advance the next slide. So this is also, uh, you can see here, a depiction of A1 and A3 scenarios. Again, most economists believe that the, the, uh, the A3 scenario, this V-shaped immediate, immediate return over a quarter, quarter and a half period is very unlikely, uh, whereas many are settling on an A1 scenario where you know, the third and fourth quarter uh, of, of the year, as well as first quarter, will start seeing more recovery in 21. Now, a lot of that is uncertain with COVID outbreaks. You've seen it and probably you saw in the national uh, publications this week, I believe it was Wall Street Journal referencing the states and their COVID response as well as the curve of cases. Arizona has been late to that, uh, that, that bell curve. And, and so we're still seeing consistent case numbers, whereas these other markets on the East Coast predominantly peaked and have, have seen uh, a receding from their peak. So let's go to the next one. This will, uh, this is probably the most interesting or concerning aspect of Maybe the next two slides are the most concerning aspect. Very different from the 2008 recession, which was a financial recession. This is obviously a, a pandemic-related recession, but the vulnerability in jobs is very significant in that there was a, such an immediacy of job loss, particularly in service sector entities and industries such as accommodations, hospitality, restaurants. And while we've been able to reopen the economy, there's still a, a tremendous amount of, of need within those particular sectors. And you can see on the, the left-hand column, consumer uh, sector, or excuse me, customer uh, service type roles, as well as food services, those have been the most uh, impacted. And you can see there's still, the projection is there's 1.2 million vulnerable jobs and the concentration of those jobs is what's concerning in that a recovery needs to include all workers, not just the high-end workers, but all workers. And in this case, uh, the PPP has helped, which I'll talk about here in a second. But I still believe there's a tremendous amount of runway needed to help support uh, our workers across the region getting back to work. Go ahead. So next is the, the pay band aspect of these vulnerable jobs. And, and this is what I just referenced. Most of these come in the, the low to moderate skill and, and moderate wage sectors. And again, it's very important that as GPEC historically is focused on high wage job growth, we're going to have to think differently as not only to how we support tradable sectors, technology jobs, and those that have higher multiplier impacts, but we're also going to have to support, uh, I believe, additional state and local programs to help middle skill workers uh, in upskilling, reskilling, and enhanced ability to get back to work because the jobs model will not be an immediate return uh, like many hoped uh, a quarter ago. Go ahead. So let's talk just briefly about the, the Paycheck Protection Program. You've probably heard a lot about this in the national headlines, but Arizona performed very uh, poorly in the first round of the PPP. GPAC decided along with our partners with the city of Tempe and our 22 communities across the region to put full court press on supporting small business. Second round, we did exceedingly well, almost uh, two, a little over two times the, the number of loans 
and we were top 10 across the uh, against the other 50 states in the number of loans awarded. Uh, you can see the $8.5 billion of capital injected into our state. What's even more important, however, in the next four weeks, you're going to see the round one and round two uh, awardees it is now the time when those loans transition to a grant. Uh, and that was the whole intent of PPP to make these monies liquid within the balance sheet of these companies as opposed to maintaining as a liability. So, you know, our next focus is how do we ensure a lot of the small businesses, you can see 73,000 of them across the state, we need those to convert to grants. And so I've been doing a lot of almost PSAs with media talking about that particular issue. Go ahead. So I won't spend a lot of time on this, but there is a, a number of shifts taking place globally. And typically I would spend 30 minutes on this, so I, I won't indulge you there, but uh, you're seeing factions related to globalization. Uh, unequivocally supply chains are going to be forever changed because of COVID. So you know, we're seeing global companies look at supply chains, look at, you know, there's gonna be movements around producing in the US and we wanna make sure the region's well positioned for that. Also in the recovery, you will see more digitization, automation, mechanization around manufacturing. One of the companies in Tempe, Benchmark Electronics, uh, is an example of that where highly automated facilities with uh, not only you know, significant engineering talent, but also uh, uh, significant levels of, of uh, kind of middle skill workers as well, in addition to the high end workers. So we need to induce more of those to happen, but that's the more likely scenario coming out of this downturn. The knowledge economy, there's going to be a fight for talent and a fight for uh, ensuring that the middle class and the middle skill worker uh, skill set gets upgraded. And then there's going to be an intense focus also uh, as we look at uh, the safety aspects of, of healthcare, uh, safety aspects of the, the populace uh, in the healthcare needs and how that relates to supply chain of PPE. So a lot there. And, and the last piece here, you can see commercial airlines and transportation overall, whether it's Uber and Lyft or it's bus systems and, and so forth, this public transit uh, you know, focus is going to be there in addition to commercial airline contraction that we're likely to see across the country. Go ahead. Let's have a few more slides here I'll finish up with. Uh, on the good news front, you know, if you go ahead, I'll give you a quick uh, purview to the uh, business development side. So uh, back uh, in March, I had a very different perspective than I do today, sitting here first week of June, uh, with the mass uncertainty that occurred in, in the first, uh, end of first quarter, as we saw COVID outbreaks, I was really concerned about overall job growth and, and net activity that we were experiencing. Uh, April and May rebounded very strong from a slow March and our June thus far looks very strong. And so Tempe is a unique you know, locational advantages, labor force advantages, uh, transportation connectivity advantages, obviously university asset in the backyard. Tempe is gonna be, continue to be one of the main communities in our region that has success in not only recruiting jobs, but supporting and cultivating uh, your entrepreneurial system, which you've done a great job of. And so we see that over the next quarter or two, we expect these national trends to benefit Phoenix. And again, I wish I had more time to talk about them tonight, mayor and council, but you're going to see mass consolidation of shared services into mass regional headquarters, much like you know, you've, you've seen with a lot of your companies in your community along the waterfront, you're going to see more of that just because companies want an attractive place for their employees to live that's affordable with modern infrastructure with great local and state leadership. So we're in a unique spot as it relates to uh, net job growth that I still anticipate coming here. Go ahead. So you can see our pipeline. I'll just leave the visual up there, but you know, we're talking you know, almost $15 billion worth of potential investment and in, in over 30,000 jobs still in our queue. And, you know, while we're, while we've been, uh, had a softer quarter than normal, uh, the, the, again, the May and, and June numbers thus far look very, very favorable, and Tempe wins its fair share of the deals that look at the market, which is the region uh, overall. Go ahead. So to finish up, these are just a few examples on the screen here of, of a couple uh, projects that we have the pleasure of working with the city of Tempe on. Uh, I couldn't be more excited that, you know, companies, uh, Singapore-based like Acronis and others are investing there uh, in the community. Shell Point Mortgage was a uh, in acquisition and turnaround play for a, a pretty high number of jobs. Centene is a St. Louis based company we supported uh, as well. So again, you're, you're seeing, you know, kind of great depth of the Tempe labor pool and commercial real estate market. And again, you've been the shining star as a community as we go out and tap, tout uh, our technology and manufacturing job growth nationally. Go ahead. So that's all I have for tonight, Mayor. I, I just, I'll, I'll close with this. 
you know, our GPEC historically has been your longstanding partner on the recruitment front and the branding and marketing front. We've spent a considerable amount of the last quarter really trying to create the regional system to support small, medium-sized businesses because that's where we believe the absolute need was. And so I just appreciate your time uh, this evening and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have or if you'd like to move on, that's fine as well. So thank you again. Chris, thank you so much. And, and I've been fortunate because I've, I've served with you on the GPEC board and have seen that presentation. And it's exciting, at least during the times that we're in, that we're seeing the potential of $15 billion in investment in our state, as well as over 33,000 jobs. So that's, and thank you for the hard work that you do on a regional level. Uh, it's much appreciated. I'm going to ask my council colleagues, do you have any questions for uh, Chris Camacho? Uh, Lauren Kibbe, Vice Mayor Kibbe. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris, so much for coming. I, I watched your presentation at the April 28th meeting, I think, at the Phoenix City Council, because that's what I do in my spare time is watch other meetings. But I really want to thank you for coming. We needed to see this um, economic analysis of the region because we work together as a region, we hope, especially in these times. I did want to ask one question. I know we've often heard that there's a lack of, of skilled labor and highly skilled labor in the construction and, and trades in the region we know with hopefully rebuilding of infrastructure we need to see uh we need to see more highly skilled workers do you have any thoughts on that and how the region could approach that as a as a regional problem and offer regional solutions thank you very much for the question uh, councilwoman and you know what i would say on the broad-based uh, technical labor side this and this is something i talked about on a webcast i did recently there's been massive enhanced capability within the region since the last recession. The quality of the labor pool, the depth of labor pool, the skill of the labor pool has massively changed. And so we're in a much better position for new companies, expanding companies and so forth. But as it relates to construction, uh, you know, there, there is a leading up to this downturn, there, there's been just because of the overarching activity, uh, there continues to be a shortage of, and this is a national issue, not just uh, Arizona, uh, but of the highly skilled trade uh, sector. And so what I've observed with the community colleges and, and other technical schools, there is a focus in the region to really try to get more of the high school kids that, that may not see necessarily a default position to enter the trades or trades curriculum to really focus in that area because whether it's electricians or roofers or you name it, mechanics, there's an overarching demand for those skills. And you know we wanna make sure that we're bringing from an equity standpoint and diversity inclusion standpoint, the entirety of the labor force to ensure that it's prepared for this next generation of jobs. So you're gonna have the trade skills still in high demand as we continue to be the fastest growing region in the country, coupled with making sure we're doubling down on the engineering school at ASU, for example, or a supply chain school within the universities as well. So we, we take that all very seriously. And, and that is one that I know that the, our partners at the regional chamber, they have a, uh, chamber collaborative focused on the construction trades and creating not only marketing but creating awareness campaigns for students to go into those fields. Great, thank you, Chris. Thanks so much, Chris. Anybody thank else you. have any questions for Chris? All right, Chris, thank you. I know you, your time is valuable, so thank you so much. Um, and, and hopefully, you land a that potential client that you're referring to and, and they land in Tempe. So thank you. Safe travels. Thank you very much. You bet. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Next, we're going to call on uh, Dr. Joshua LaBear, who is the executive director of the Biodesign Institute at Arizona State University uh, to make a presentation. Uh, Dr. LaBear, are you with us? Let me see if I can do that. Can you hear me? Hear you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I, I need to um, share something from my machine. So can someone hand me the, oh, I'm now the presenter. Okay, brilliant. As, and hopefully that is working. Can you all see that? Look at that technology. Great. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to uh, make go to this here. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about some of the things we're doing at Biodesign for testing. And let's see if this uh, advances. So, great. thank you. Great. Uh, can you see that now? All right. Um, yeah. So, uh, uh, please interrupt me if anyone has a question, but I'll just dive right in. 
this is, um, uh, there are two types of tests that we think of when we think about testing for the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, the two tests are serology testing, which answers the question, did I already have the virus in the past? And the other test is uh, qPCR testing, which answers the question, do I currently have the virus or am I infectious right now? All right. Um, for people who are interested in serology testing, this is measuring an antibody response to the virus, to specific proteins in the virus. Um, pe people who have already had the virus will typically make these antibodies. We believe that will make them resistant to the virus. And this type of test is useful for epidemiologists to track the path of the virus. I will tell you now that most people are not seropositive, probably around 1% to 2% at most in our population, certainly less than 3%. 97% of us are still susceptible to the virus. That means we are fuel for its fire, is what I like to say. The testing that our lab does is called uh, qPCR testing. And that type of test measures the RNA of the virus, typically in the oropharynx, because that's where the virus uh, tends to occur. It tells us that the person has the virus right now, and it tells us that the person is most likely currently infectious. Uh, we think that this is the kind of test that you need to do to monitor the workplace to make sure that people stay safe. And of course, if you're positive, you should be contact traced. Okay, so um, those of you who are familiar with testing may have seen a scene like this if you got tested. Um, these, this is how we used to test for the virus. We would have these drive-through operations. People would pull up in a car. Um, let me see if I can, if I can, uh, yeah. Here's, here's the car down here, if you can see that. And then all these folks here are the nurses, volunteer nurses from um, ASU's College of Nursing and Health Innovation who dressed up, as you can see, in quite a bit of PPE to protect themselves. And that's because they had to put a swab through the nose to the back of the throat where they would collect the virus. That swab could induce coughing, it could induce sneezing. And so they would get sprayed with this. Uh, up, so that's why they get it through the window of a car and that's why they had to wear all of this paraphernalia. So what we've been working on uh, is the idea of collecting saliva. The notion here is that saliva is easy to collect. You don't really need a lot of extensive PPE to collect it. Um, it is more sensitive for detection of the virus than, than a swab is. It's less variable, uh, very consistent from person to person. The saliva sample is stable at, at, uh, on ice or at room temperature for four days. And we can detect only a, a couple hundred viruses per specimen. Keep in mind that most specimens have a million or so viruses in them, so we're well above the de detection. And right over here is the collection kit. This is a drinking straw, and this is an empty tube. That's all we need. So um, these are some data. I won't spend a lot of time showing you lots of data. Just want to show you that in general, hey, where's, my, where's my mouse here? Okay, it's jumping around a little bit too much. Um, uh, in general, um, saliva is more sensitive, it has a higher signal than, than, than the swabs do. All right, and then we've also done extensive temperature testing and we can show for up to four days. So this is um, uh, 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours, and 96 hours after collecting the specimen. There's virtually no change in, in any of the, of the reads here. So um, we've, we've done testing on about 69 paired samples. And uh, any time that a uh, nasal swab was positive, so was the saliva. One time the saliva was positive, but the nasal swab wasn't. Uh, this just kind of indicates we think that the, nasal, that the saliva is a little bit more sensitive. So, um, and of course we've shown that we can get uh, very, very sensitive small numbers of, of viruses. These are some of the people in our team that are, are running a test on our robots here. Um, this is the platform we use to test. We, we collect the sample out of the tubes in this hood here. This device here is a robot that will isolate the RNA from the virus and the saliva. This is a robot that will add the chemicals we need to detect the virus. And these are the two devices that we use to actually read the samples out. And then um, this is the complex test. I'm not going to walk you through all that. I kind of told it to you. Um, we've sent this out to people if you want to see it. This is what the test results look like. 
This is a negative test. We always have one positive control in every sample. This just shows us the test worked. And this is a positive test. This person has the virus. The red, the red, blue, and green curves indicate when they go above this line here that this person was positive for the virus. So um, uh, I'm going to skip that. Oh, well, I, I guess I'll stop there before I do that. Let me go back here. Are there any questions about the saliva test? Yes, thank you, LeBaire. I'm going to now turn to my council colleagues. Do you have any questions for Dr. LeBaire? I don't see any hands up. Okay, I would, someone also asked me to talk about... <laughs> sorry, I do have questions. Sorry. Okay, yep. Yeah. I'm so sorry. I couldn't get to my unmute button. I wanted to know, um, well, remind me how fast the saliva-based test is and, and how fast does it need to be to effective contact tracing? Oh, okay, so what was the first question? How fast is it? Like when the results come back? Okay, yeah. Fast? For our laboratory, we, we promise results in 48 hours. We usually deliver them in 24. So we try to get okay. those answers out really quickly. Um, and, yeah. mm -hmm. and Josh, how accurate are the self-administered nasal swab tests that have been kind of popularized at CVS? We're not big fans of those. I don't think that they're great. Um, and of course, if, you, if you're sending away your own sample and waiting for the results to come back, it's often up to five days. One of the reasons we try to get the results out quickly is so that we can get that person contact traced immediately. Because as you know, the most important part of getting a positive result is finding out who that person has been in touch with the last several days and get them tested as well. That's how we get ahead of the virus. That's how we stop it from spreading. And, and do you think now we have an adequate testing program in the state of Arizona? I think we're, we're moving in that direction, but I don't think we're doing, we, need, we still need to do more testing. And honestly, some of the challenges in getting people tested is getting the sample. And that's why we can move towards saliva collection because it's a lot easier to collect saliva than it is to collect the swabs. Thank you. I have more non-test related questions, but I'll wait. Uh, okay, thank you though. Now, now some, I was asked to talk about two other things, and it's up to you if I do. One was to talk about some of the research we're doing, and one was to show you um, what our website and our, our, our online curves are showing so people can follow the... the well, I, think, I think we can talk about some of the research, but I think Lauren has some questions, and then we're going to have to move on. Thank you. Oh, no, I, I think the questions might be answered by the presentations. I would love to see them. And okay. I think our listeners and watchers would, too. I'll go quickly through the research. Um, well, this is one of the projects we're working on is how to track antibody responses. This is typically how it's done right now, which is testing one protein at a time. So here's a positive result and here's a negative result. Um, what our lab is doing is testing many proteins at a time. So we're printing hundreds of proteins and adding blood to it and then seeing responses. Now, why would we do that? I'm gonna skip this for the sake of argument uh, because we wanna go quickly. We, we barcode our proteins with a little DNA barcode and we, we separate them by res the response and then we read the barcode in, an, in a DNA sequencing device. And that's the process here. And I won't go through all of that. Um, uh, I'm gonna skip this because I know we're short on time. So we did the tests on a, on, a, on a virus called HPV. Some of you have heard of this virus. It's the one that causes cervical cancer. And there are eight proteins in an HPV virus. And um, we've barcoded all eight of them. And there are several different virus, there are multiple different types of, of virus. Um, here are two of them, HPV6 and HPV11, that don't cause cancer. And then all the rest of these cause cancer. And each of these little black marks you see is a protein made by the virus um, that we've had a barcode to. Uh, I'm gonna skip that. Uh, and then this is what the results look like. Here you see, um, uh, a number of patients who have oropharyngeal cancer and here a number of controls. And you can see that the controls, the healthy people don't make antibodies in this virus. The people with cancer make antibodies to these viruses, 16, 18, 31, 33, 35, but not these two viruses because these two don't cause cancer and these viruses cause cancer. So that's what we're doing. It's a very reproducible test. And now we're making a similar test to coronavirus. So you, you may know that this virus here at the bottom, SARS-CoV-2, is the virus that causes COVID-19. You may also know that there are many other known coronaviruses. 
the MERS virus and the SARS, the original SARS virus here, um, these two cause other deadly diseases. And then 229, NL61, OC43, and HKU1 cause colds. The reason we're testing all of these proteins for all these viruses is we want to understand if a person has previously had a coronavirus, is, are those the people that have the milder course of coronavirus? And are the people who've never seen those viruses before the ones who have the severe case? Um, we don't know, and that's why we want to test this, and that's what our test will be doing. So I'm going to uh, skip that, and I'm going to, how do I unshare this? Uh, oh, yeah, I, got, I go up here and stop sharing. And then I'm going to share one other thing to show you that I think some of you are going to be interested in, which is understanding how to track the virus. So if I click here, can you see the curve on the screen here? Yes, we can see it. Okay. So and any of you uh, interested in tracking um, the, what's going on in the state of Arizona can visit the Biodesign Institute website. That's this website here. And if you're at that website, you can scroll down to where it says critical COVID-19 trends. And you will be brought to this page here. Uh, and this is a page where, where ASU is maintaining information about what's happening with the virus. These are the number of cumulative cases in the state of Arizona, the cumulative number of deaths. We're almost about to cross 1,000 deaths in Arizona from the virus. Um, the number of daily tests that have been run that day and the number of positive tests. You scroll down, you can see county by county. On the left, the total number of cases, not surprisingly, oh, not surprisingly, Maricopa has the highest number because we have the most dense population. And on the right, you can see the per capita incidence of the virus. And you can see, um, you know, up in the northern part of the state is where the fraction of people with the highest number of cases are occurring. If you want to look at how um, the states in the United States are doing, this is the total number of cases by state. Not surprisingly, New York is very high here. And then if you look at um, the per capita, again, you know, you can see New York and New Jersey are very high. And here's Arizona in terms of per capita. And then if you want to see county by county across the US, that's what this graph shows. You can see that, again, um, our northern counties are among the highest in the country. Um, there are a couple of higher counties, but they are pretty high. Um, this is county by county, the total number of cases, and you can scroll down here and look at every county, state of Arizona. You can see Maricopa has um, the highest number. Um, this is daily testing. You can see um, this is the number of daily tests run that day. And then these are some averages of those tests. And then this is the percent positive test. And you can see that uh, the percent positive test is over here, shown by the, the red curve. These are kind of new data that we've added to our website that you're welcome to look at. Um, this is trends of inpatient uh, inpatients with COVID-19. And you can see that um, there is a steady increase now of inpatients with this disease. So it is warming up in the state a little. And then um, this is the graph that I like to follow. It's called new cases versus total cases by state. This particular graph, think of it as a way of looking at um, the, the velocity, if you will, of the virus in different locations. So, for example, if you look at a state like, this is um, Hawaii, um, whenever the graph is headed down, that is a good sign. That means that the velocity is decreasing. There are fewer and fewer new cases every day. A state like Hawaii has gotten itself down to zero new cases a day. That means that they basically stopped the spread of the virus. You can see that New York was, was heading up and to the right. That is an acceleration of new cases. That means day over day, there are more and more new cases until New York turned the corner and now New York is bringing the number of cases down. Here is Florida. Florida is running kind of horizontal. That means that they have, it's like a car going the same speed all the time, 40 miles an hour. They're, they have new cases every day, but they're not accelerating. Unfortunately, right now, this is Arizona, and in the last week or so, we're looking at a sort of acceleration of new cases in the state. We're going to have to watch that. Um, if that continues, that's a sign that we are kind of breaking out a little bit. We'll have to keep an eye on that. Um, and then you can sort of see county by county, the different counties in Arizona, and you can click on any county that you want to look at. 
If you click on Coconino, you will just see Coconino. That's kind of running parallel. Um, but then if you look at, let's say, Santa Cruz, you can see Santa Cruz is kind of headed up and to the right. So that, 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 that's all I have to say about that stuff, unless you have questions. And then I'm done. Great. Thank you, Dr. Libera, for that information. Really, really appreciate it. And thanks for what you and the Biodesign Institute do for not only for Arizona State University, but for our community and our state. Anybody else have anything? Okay. Uh, I do. Okay. Um, I have my hand up. I uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. LeBaire, for your presentation. I know the main impetus wasn't necessary to present the, the, the data at dashboard, but I'm, I'm addicted to it. I think I check it like too many times a day, but I am growing increasingly alarmed that Arizona has taken a turn for the worse, and you alluded to that um, when you look at the new cases versus total cases. And I worry about the governor's uh, premature opening of, of the state, and we are faced with a decision in Tempe. Um, we're preliminarily looking at June 15th, but we're looking at the trends very seriously um, because we want to ensure that our, our workers, our staff are safe. We want to make sure our residents are safe, especially at indoor locations. Could you speak a little bit about that, about the transmissions in indoor locations, knowing that asymptomatic people can spread it with, um, with aerosol? Right. Right. Well, you've said, you've said the most important thing. I think one of the things that makes this virus such a nasty virus, I like to say that it won the trifecta for nasty viruses. First of all, it, it's a virus that has a high mortality attached to it. It's about 10 times worse than the flu. The second part of the trifecta is that it is spread by aerosols, and that is a tough way to spread a virus. It means it's very easy to give it from one person to another. And then the third thing you also alluded to, which is that it is it is spread by asymptomatic individuals. The peak of infectivity appears to be about 24 hours before symptoms start. Um, that means, in my view, that this is not primarily spread by coughing. It is spread by speech. When people talk, they produce water droplets. In fact, they produce about 2,600 water droplets per second during normal speech. Those things spread out up to a radius of about six feet, and that is why we do the social distancing thing. Um, and I would say probably the most important thing we can all do right now to protect each other is wear masks when we're indoors and when we're near each other. Um, we know that masks uh, do a very good job of limiting the spread of the virus. Um, one of the things that worries me is when I go out shopping and when I go out in the community, I see a lot of people walking around without masks and I see people hanging out at bars without masks and and um, that is how the virus is spreading around. And I think that's why the curve is headed up. I, I, think it's, I think we all understand the need to open up businesses, and I think we should be doing that. But we need to do it safely, and that means we got to wear masks, we got to wash our hands, we got to maintain social distancing. we got to follow these guidelines that keep the virus from spreading from one person to another. And, and Dr. Yeah. LeBerry, something to the fact that um, there's – minute transmission that happens and that it may not re result in a, a full-blown case or it could be asymptomatic, but it's continued transmission, continued exposure. And that's why grocery store workers and restaurant workers and people that have contact with people a lot are really on the front lines of this health crisis. Yes, no, there's no doubt about it. I mean, I think the most risky jobs are jobs that involve contact with, if you will, the public, particularly with anonymous individuals that they're never going to be able to get in touch with after the event, right? If we're in an office with other people we know, at least we can let each other know if we get sick. But yes, there's no doubt about it. And, and again, um, you know, when people are out in public, that's when it's really especially important to be wearing um, uh, mouth covering, you know, so that the, the, the virus doesn't spread uh, that way. No doubt about it. So I don't want to put you on the spot, but what would be your advice to the city if the city's considering opening on June 15th? Um, what would your advice be to the city, your scientific advice? Well, scientifically, I would say, um, let's do it smart. Let's, let's, you know, really encourage people to um, wear face covering. Let's encourage people to maintain social distancing. Um, you know, businesses should be thinking about ways that they can, you know, do what they do in the safest possible way. I mean, I think that's, that's the part that I think we have to really pay attention to. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. LeBaire. I really, really, and the council really appreciates your presentation. Um, 
Thank you very, very much for that information. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I'm happy to be here. All right, thank you so much. All right, you know, we're gonna move on now to our next item, which is the Tempe Economic Development Efforts related to COVID. And I believe we have uh, Donna Kennedy and Bria and Jill on standby. Thank you, Mayor. We've got the team that have been working okay. on. Yeah, I'm sorry. I need to go back. I didn't see it. I've seen an automatic. I'm sorry. Uh, Councilman Redondo would like to say something. Dr. LeBear, is he so honored to leave? I apologize. I'm still here. Okay, Councilman Redondo Savage. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I, I thought I was following proper protocol. I had my hand up. So. I, I apologize. It says Otto, so I didn't know. Sorry. Well, that's my new name today, so thank you for that. Um, hey, thank you, Dr. LeBear. I really do appreciate the information and uh, all your work. And, uh, wow. Just a, a couple of questions I just want to kind of clarify. You guys are, so you guys are actually doing testing yourselves then, correct? Did I get that yes, right? Yes, we are. Yes. How many people have you tested and, and what's your goal moving forward? Um, so we've tested probably close to 7,000 now. Um, we really want to get that number up higher. I'd like to be close. To, I'd like to be testing close to 1,000 a day. Um, wow. It's really a question of getting the samples in the door. And now that we're doing saliva testing, I think that's going to be easier. You know, when you have to collect samples by NP swabs, um, setting up the testing sites is quite involved. Um, yeah. We are actually building another parallel automation line, and so our, our, by the end of summer, we will have probably a, 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 the capability of testing many thousands a day if, if that number comes in. And obviously, ASU is thinking about how it's going to manage the opening up of the school, and uh, testing will be a key component of that. Right. I, I certainly understand. And I'm wondering, of, your, of the ones that you've tested, how many have tested positive? Our, you know, we are testing primarily asymptomatic individuals because we are not a clinical care provider. We are really just a, a research laboratory, if you will. So our hit rate is around 1%, I would say. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. And, and I, that was kind of my other question. I wanted to ask you, and you talk a lot in your slides reference in regards to the number of positives tests. But there wasn't a lot of mention in regards to the percentage of positive tests based on the number of testing. So right. I am personally not a big fan of using the percent of positive tests because that number depends entirely on the population you're testing. If you're testing people who are, have coughs and fevers or people who come in the door of an emergency room, the percent of positive tests is going to be much higher than if you are testing the employees of a utilities company who are otherwise asymptomatic. So um, what I look at is the number of new cases per total cases. And if the, number, if, if the rate of new cases is going up, that means that it's spreading right now in your community and you got to pay attention to that. So that's a statistic that I personally like to look at more closely. Okay, so oh, that's kind of your personal thing in regards to the percentage positive versus the number of total testing then. Right, right, right. Because the total testing, if you if you run a, a, a blitz campaign where you're doing right. a lot of testing of, you know, asymptomatic individuals, you're not going to see a high percent positive test rate and it's going to look like things are getting better. But that's not really what you want to look at. Right. Well, and then I thought though too, when they did the blitz testing, I mean, obviously it was for everybody, but I think, you know, a lot of the people I had at least been um, in contact with were the ones that, you know, maybe felt like they had been exposed at some point and I sure. think that's good and comfort level for them. So I, I understand what you're saying too, but I guess I would, my thought process is if we are blitzing testing and increasing testing, then we would expect those numbers to go up. Well, and that's good. I mean, listen, the more testing we do, the better. Right. And if we find positives, by all means, let's get them and let's get them isolated until they're clear. No, I'm yeah, totally with that for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And then my last, I just, I didn't, I haven't had a chance to peruse your website that much, but I love the idea of how it 
compares itself to other states and, and what those curves look like. Um, but did you mention, and I, I apologize if I, missed, if I missed it, where your data is coming from specifically that you're using for that website? We, um, you know, we, we, we scrape it from different sources. Um, we, we get some of it from the New York Times, which has uh, an open source for collecting data. A lot of that data come from the state. Um, uh, and we also have a good relationship with the um, Department of Health in the state of Arizona, and we get some of the data from them as well. And then, you know, the difference is that we just compute it in different ways. So we're, you know, we, we build curves that aren't necessarily being made by others. We don't want to replicate what the state's already doing because they're doing a great job with their website, but we, um, we have our own way of the way we like to look at the data, and then we post that. Understood. Okay. Well, I, I just want to say I, I really do appreciate it. So thank you for taking your time to be with us here today. Um, I'm happy to do it. Wish you the best moving forward. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Dr. LeBaire. Really appreciate your time. Okay, All right. I'm gonna sign off. To, all right. Thank you. Now we're going to go ahead and turn over to uh, our economic de development efforts. And I'm going to bring in, uh, I think, Jill Bushbacker is going to be doing the presentation. Jill? You there, Jill? I'm here. Can you hear me, Mayor? We can. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much for having us this evening. So we're very pleased to share some information, kind of building on what Chris Camacho shared with us earlier about more of a, a local take on what our businesses have been going through and how we've tried to assist them during this unprecedented and challenging time for them. So some of the information that we're going to share tonight is about the work that we've done as a team, but a lot of it's also about work we've done with partners because they've been very important um, to our efforts. So as the order started to come down from the state and, and from you, uh, Mayor Mitchell, we started working together with the downtown Tempe Authority, Tempe Chamber, Tempe Tourism, and a variety of folks um, as you see there on the slide, that have been really important to our efforts and have been boots on the ground along with us and you know, in lockstep with us all along the way to make sure that we were listening to our businesses and hearing what their needs were and doing everything we could um, to, to be relevant and, and helpful at this difficult time. Um, some of the other partners that we've worked with have also um, been you know, some of the private sector companies in our community and consultants. So Desert Financial Credit Union has been a very important partner with us on our loan program. Best Companies AZ, as it relates to working with those that are looking for work and connecting them to companies that are hiring um, and really featuring our, our companies um, and you know, getting, getting the word out about those that are hiring and then those that may have been laying folks off and, and needed help getting those folks placed in, in new employment. Yelton and Associates is a group that we worked with that we had originally hired to do some entrepreneurship and lead generation with us. And we kind of had them pivot because of, of their breadth of experience. And they've done some webinars for our community that have been very helpful to our small businesses. Acronis, Pound, Business Warrior, and others are businesses in our community that have really stepped up and provided some additional and free services to help small businesses specifically with some of the challenges they've encountered during this time. And we've, we've tried to make sure that we promoted those through our website and social media and featured them um, from time to time also in webinars. So we really appreciated all that they were doing and wanted to make sure uh, that folks knew about those opportunities. Our other partners have been federal, state, and county organizations. Um, the Commerce Authority, who is our statewide counterpart in economic development, um, has been a tremendous resource and has provided a lot of information um, to the business community. And we've tried to make sure that we pushed that out and we highlighted it in, in the different methods that we communicated with our businesses, whether it was through the webinars or it was through, um, you know, shout outs and social media, or it was through specific um, email blasts that we did uh, to several thousand businesses from time to time about the different resources. SCORE, SBA, SBDC, you see there's a whole variety of folks that have been really important to us. Um, and certainly GPEC 
as a, a critical regional partner um, has been key in that. And um, you, you were able to hear from Chris Camacho this evening about some of the trends and information and programs that, that they've been working on. So we all work hand in hand. And it's been a time that, you know, the silver lining in this has been that we've come together and, and stepped up. Our businesses have, our associations, our other partners. And we've been really pleased to be able to say that everyone's worked together extremely well, um, all for the good of helping our, our small business community in particular. I, I don't want to fail to mention also our internal partners. Our strategic management and diversity office has been really key to helping our efforts as well. And they especially helped with our Buy Now, Save Local campaign. So we really appreciate them supporting our work and walking hand in hand with us through this journey as well. Um, city manager's office, all of you. And, and so we just appreciate that very much. Our Tempe IDA, I wanna make sure I mention them as well. They've provided some funding and, and uh, financial support um, to some of the efforts that we've undertaken during this time. So we've really appreciated them stepping up and doing that. That's been exciting to have them involved in it. So when we've reached out to our businesses, whether it was through visits or it was Zoom meetings or it was phone calls or email, um, and then also through some of the boots on the ground information that we got from our partners with the Chamber and DTA, we learned that their top concerns were related to cash flow, help with the federal ap applications for the loan programs, and you know once things started to change and we started to reopen slowly. They wanted information and help with reopening and helping to get the word out to everyone in the community that they are open, that they are practicing um, distancing and cleanliness practices and wearing masks and, and following all the guidelines and wanted to make everyone feel welcome and safe and comfortable in frequenting their businesses. Some of the programs that we were able to come up with during this time um, have been a small business emergency loan program that we did in conjunction with um, Desert Financial Credit Union. At this point, um, we can happily report about $225,000 worth of loans have been placed in our small business community. And that impacts about 105 employees and their families, um, that have, you know, many of which have, have been able to to continue to be paid and employed during this time because of these kinds of programs. So we're very pleased to have been able to have brought that forward um, with your support. We were able to do webinars, as I alluded to earlier, on some topics that seem to be timely and relevant based on the feedback we were getting from our businesses, um, helping them with their loan applications through the SBDC, or providing them with information about you know, moving more of their business online if some of them had to have their storefronts closed um, so they could continue to generate revenue. The Small Business Development Center was really key in helping, and then also the local SBA office. They were very helpful in, with many of our companies in answering questions and helping them be successful in getting some of those loans. Um, and then, of course, along with our partners um, and, and with our tremendous public information officer, Chris Baxter, uh, we were able to get the word out um, to many of our businesses and to the community about these different programs through a web page that was created in a special section for businesses and we updated the resources on it regularly we pushed it out to our partners and they in turn sent it out and we sent this out to thousands of businesses um, on a regular basis in our community so we really um, you know, we're appreciative of those efforts that were done in conjunction with our partners and with our PIO. Without those marketing efforts, we wouldn't have had the successes that we've had. The other campaign that we rolled out was the Buy Now, Save Local campaign. And many of you, as you see in the photos there, went out and helped us promote that program, met with our businesses and let them know that we care we want you know, to promote them to the community and remind people to frequent them. And you know, if they can spend their money there and really help you know, the character and the continuation of our tremendous small business community in Tempe. Through this program, folks were able to buy service vouchers and support these companies. And over a hundred businesses have participated so far, raising about $25,000 in revenue. And so the Tempe IDA, and uh, as well as um, some city general funds 
are supporting the merchant fees so that this program has been free to our businesses that are participating during this campaign. And so we're very pleased to have been able to contribute in that way, um, that we've been able to raise that amount of money. And, and the campaign continues and will continue for many more months to come. And we continue to work with our partners to keep pushing the word out about this and appreciate everyone um, in the community and elsewhere frequenting our businesses, buying these vouchers and shopping Tempe to help these companies survive and thrive. Something else that we've had the pleasure of working on during this time um, is learning about our tremendous companies that have pivoted their efforts to help with the needs related to COVID-19 as far as personal protective equipment. So many of them were making other products before and now they're making masks and gowns and shields and they're making hand sanitizer. And we're really, really pleased um, to, have been able to, help, uh, to have been able to help them in a variety of ways, whether it was getting them a lean manufacturing consultant as they were getting to have been able to help them in a variety of the state's MEP program, or it was getting, um, you know, the IDA aware of a variety of ways, um, you know, the IDA aware of some of the work contribution financially to help them buy some of that equipment to make the isolation gowns, or if it was helping some of these companies find commercial space to expand and be able to ramp up these operations. Um, we're just really so proud that these companies are part of our community and are helping in so many ways. Um, I can just say really quickly, in fact, I was able to visit a company today, Vomaris, and they're making masks um, that are, will be considered, we believe, antiviral. Uh, and so they're a tremendous um, discovery and a tremendous product uh, that they hope to be able to provide uh, to the community and the public and, and to hospitals and, and everyone that needs them um, this fall. So it's really exciting to have companies in Tempe doing so many great things. Our other departments, as I mentioned, have been key and you all have been key in supporting policies uh, that were out of the box and really helped our businesses um, during this time in ways that you know no one had planned for and expected. Um, but it's been helpful for them to be able to you know, have banners without having to go through the permitting process during this time, or to expand their premises so that they could have more seating um, and still observe social distancing, or extend their development agreements because some of the conditions um, have, have changed and, and, and really warrant that. So we appreciate everyone being willing um, to, you know, be flexible and helpful at this time and pivot so quickly to meet the needs of our business community. We're really proud to have been able to have offered those things with you all to our business community. And just here's a few more pictures of some of our tremendous businesses. You all have visited, we visited, they've sent pictures. It's been terrific um, to get the word out about them. And, and actually I didn't mention, we've had more than 2 million impressions on all the shout outs and, and campaigns we've done to promote local business. So we, we've, feel that, you know, that's a, a pretty good number and, and we know that that's translated to some business um, sales for them. So we're, we're yes. pleased to be able to purport, report that. And before um, I, I close, I just want to say um, that our, our director, Donna Kennedy, and I are available to answer any of your questions and appreciate all of your support all along the way through this time. Yeah, we're very lucky to have uh, the support that we do with the local businesses and the relationships. Uh, Council Member Adams. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to compliment uh, Donna and Jill on, on their incredible presentation and all the hard work they've done to support our local businesses and to help them with uh, getting through all the paperwork and everything that they've done presentation is excellent and I'm just so proud to um, have such a great team uh, working for the city of Tempe so thank you Donna and Jill very much all right anybody else have any questions for Jill and the council uh, Joel councilman Navarro yeah how do you hear me mayor we can hear you okay yeah, no, I just want to say thank you. I mean, there's a great presentation. I, I enjoy the fact that um, our business community and, and our city is working together 
um, to look at things and to try to relax some things that make business uh, a little bit easier. So um, great presentation. I just, you know, as we go forward um, through these challenging times, you know, there's opportunity for um, us to look at things in a different way and to challenge uh, how we can um, help our business community uh, expand and, and make Tempe even more vibrant. So uh, I look forward to uh, what may come ahead and um, I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks. Thank you, Joel. Um, I don't see any other hands. Again, thank you to, to Jill and Donna and Maria. Thank you for the whole team for everything you guys are doing and also our great stakeholders that we have in our community. Really appreciate it. All right, we're gonna move on to the next item, which is uh, speed limits regarding vision zero. I'm gonna turn it over to, I think Marilyn DeRosa, uh, Shelly Seiler and Julian Dressing are here, but I think Marilyn, I'm gonna hand this over to you. Uh, that is correct. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just uh, I turned on my camera to say hi, and now I'll now I'll turn it off. Um, <laughs> Why? <Just kidding. laughs> let me share my screen. Um, there you go. Okay. So um, let me put this in a full screen mode. There we go. Um, so uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, I'm Marilyn Drosso, your engineering and transportation director. And uh, as the mayor said, I have Shelly Seiler and Julian Dersang with me, uh, our deputy directors. Uh, we're going to use about 14 slides to talk about our work evaluating speed limits citywide uh, and our outreach to the community regarding um, any recommendations for speed limit changes. <clears throat> the performance measure here is 1.08. Uh, achieve a reduction in the number of fatal and serious injury crashes to zero. In 2018, we came to council with some modified speed limit recommendations uh, focused on school zones near high schools, locations with inconsistent speed limits or with arterial mid-block speed limit changes, uh, and areas with recently completed streetscape projects. The recommendation at that time included uh, nine R street segments, nine collector segments, and seven uh, of the 35 mile per hour school zones near high school. At that presentation, council recommended staff undergo a, a robust public outreach program before adopting any of the recommendations. Around the same time, staff was working with the community to develop the first in the state Vision Zero Action Plan. And strategies related to speeding were included in that plan. Uh, so staff undertook as one of our first Vision Zero strategies, uh, citywide speed limit evaluation, and to ensure the evaluation used factors such as crash history and the safety of pedestrian and bicyclists, we used the safe systems approach. Staff came back to council last August with a recommendation to set speed limits citywide based on that Vision Zero action plan and using the safe systems approach uh, we had maximum arterial speed limits recommended between 30 and 40 miles per hour based on the level of bike and pedestrian activity, but with the exception of Mill Avenue. And maximum local and neighborhood speed limits were recommended between 20 and 25 miles an hour. Uh, we took those recommendations to the community through several uh, complementary mediums. Uh, we used social media, online digital ads, press releases, Tempe Today, uh, and, uh, and other methods to advertise for very well attended public meetings uh, and direct the community to the online portal for comments. With the council and the, at all those public meetings, we talked about uh, speed. We talked about how speed relates to safety, about momentum and stopping distance, about kinetic energy and force, uh, and how those things translate to more severe or fatal injuries for individuals involved in a crash, particularly uh, pedestrians and bicyclists. Uh, this is a slide you've seen before. We talked a lot about data. Uh, the, the chart on the left uh, shows the locations of serious injury or fatal crashes in Tempe between 2012 and 2018. There is a higher incidence of crashes in North Tempe uh, but you can see by the scatter of dots that really no part of our community is spared. Uh, and after failed 
to yield right of way. Speed to fast for conditions is the most common violation resulting in a serious injury or fatal crash. Uh, we also talked about the safe systems approach. Uh, safe systems is a relatively new approach to transportation and planning uh, that's just beginning to gain ground in communities across the country. It isn't the traditional 85 percentile engineering method for setting speed limits. Instead, it recognizes that people are going to make, make mistakes, and it allows for those mistakes. Uh, so, and safe speeds, at the bottom there, you can see that safe speeds is just part of an overall strategy for safe travel. So at the public meetings, uh, we had very engaged residents uh, and involved in healthy conversation. And on this slide, we've presented a short list of some of the more common discussion topics. Uh, I'm not going to read through this slide. I, I think some of the council members may have similar questions. Uh, so I'm not going to read through this slide now. But we can revisit any of these discussion topics um, at the end of the presentation. We'll be happy to address them as comprehensively as any of uh, the council members uh, would like. With respect to the responses, we received 233 unduplicated comments online or at the public meetings. And all those comments are provided in your packet. There was support and opposition to the recommendation. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm not going to read through this slide, but some of the more common comments uh, are shown here in bold. So I, I wanted to, uh, I tried to get through that quickly so we could get to the alternative. Um, if you've had a chance to review the packet, uh, you'll notice there are three options rather than originally we had a single recommendation. Any of these alternatives and uh, will help us move the needle on our performance measure and will result in safer streets. Uh, so let's look at the map to better understand the different alternatives. The map on the left displays Tempe's arterial speed limits as they are today. Uh, you'll notice they appear, uh, the US 60 is there in the center of the map. It's Superstition Freeway, labeled Superstition Freeway. Uh, Hang on, whoever's typing, can you please mute? Oh, thank you, thank Mayor. You. Um, you'll notice that the speed limits north of the Superstition Freeway appear somewhat inconsistent, uh, inconsistent based on the colors. Uh, each color represents a different value. Uh, but they generally range from 35 to 45 miles per hour. Uh, south of the US 60, however, you'll notice they are relatively consistent, uh, and red is equivalent to 45 miles per hour. Uh, the map on the right displays how those speed limits would change under alternative A. While not exclusively true, for the most part, arterials north of the US 60 would be changed to 35 miles per hour, which is the lime green. Uh, and to create more consistency uh, in the east-west and north-south corridors, uh, arterials south of the US 60 already enjoy relatively consistent speeds, uh, but they'd be redu reduced from, in this alternative, be reduced from 45 to 40 miles per hour. Uh, and then in addition, uh, there are the high school, 35 miles per hour at all times, would be changed to 35 miles per hour when lights are flashing. Uh, everybody, uh, everybody was supportive of that, the school districts, we reached out to them. And staff would fix an inconsistency, an administrative inconsistency with a, a posted speed limit on college between Alameda and the US 60, which isn't uh, documented in ordinance. And it requires council to make that change. Now, alternative B is, uh, again, the map on the left displays Tempe's arterial speed limits as they are today. The map on the right displays how those speed limits would change um, under alternative B. The changes north of the US 60 and at the, uh, at the high schools and at, along college are the same as in alternative A. So that we would 
have some consistency for speed limits north of the freeway. Um, and all the speed limits, however, south of the US 60 would remain unchanged at 60, I'm sorry, at 45 miles per hour. So uh, the, there wasn't a concern about consistency south of the uh, Superstition Freeway. So alternative C then, uh, finally, it addresses the high school zone uh, and the speed limit, the administrative concern with the speed limit along college. And we went to the Transportation Commission uh, last month and they supported and recommended alternative A. Uh, in addition, they recommended making Apache Boulevard 30 miles per hour between Rural Road and the city border with Mesa. So um, I just, this, that concludes my presentation. I just want to uh, repeat that uh, any of these alternatives will help us move the needle on our performance measure. Uh, we have a host, of, uh, a host of strategies related to our Vision Zero uh, action plan uh, and uh, any of these alternatives will help us move in that direction uh, and, and will ultimately result in uh, safer streets. So uh, we're asking for council feedback uh, and are available to answer any questions. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have Shelly, Julian, and myself, and I believe that uh, if you have questions about enforcement, uh, that uh, we can have a PD representative. So thank you for, uh, for listening. Thank, thank you, Marilyn, and thank you for the presentation, and thank you to Marilyn and Julian and, and Shelly as well. Um, we really want to appreciate, I do appreciate you going back out to get additional public comment. Um, we know that uh, the many more hours of staff time was dedicated to that effort. And I want you to know that it did not go unnoticed um, from the council. So thank you again. Um, and obviously, uh, I'm going to turn, I don't see any hands up. I'm going to turn to my council colleagues. Is, is there any comments from the council on this? Uh, Council Member Chen, then even Vice thank Mayor Chen. Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Marilyn and staff and, and Julian and Shelley um, for your work on this one. Uh, philosophically, I think Vision Zero, I absolutely agree with it. I think the implementation, right, is always the, the challenge here. Um, let me... Um, say that I, I don't think we're ready yet. I, I find some inconsistencies in all three of the proposals, uh, A, B, and C. Uh, for example, on Guadalupe Road, if you're a resident, if I'm a resident who is traveling westbound on Guadalupe, and that change um, in the proposed uh, um, speed it, it, there seems to be a consistency issue. And I know that there are other spots in our city that may have some consistency issues. Um, let's look at that. That's, that's one item that I noticed. The other was simply changing the speed limit doesn't guarantee that people will adhere to that. And I was, I read through all of the comments um, and those are important, and I'd like to thank all the residents who participated and commented. That's, we're paying attention. And what, what I was struck by was the, the call for enforcement. Well, simply changing a speed limit then shifts the burden of, of success onto one department, the, the uh, public safety. And, and I'm not sure that's the way to do it. I also think that that's a very punitive approach because you're not trying to uh, help people change their behavior. We want people to pay attention. We want people to not be distracted and watch their speed uh, in areas. I absolutely agree on the high school zone signage. Uh, I absolutely agree with that. Um, but we need to think about how to change behavior. And one thing that I would like to ask staff to do is consider utilizing, before we jump to actually changing all of the speeds, is using dynamic speed display signs in certain areas. 
because I think I will say that if if I had ever speeded, uh, it was inadvertent. You know, it's it's many times, especially in in these uh, newer vehicles, sometimes they're performing so well you you don't notice and you're just going with the flow of traffic. But if you have a dynamic speed display sign that says, hey, this is your speed and here's the speed limit, by the way, you react to it. And, and hopefully that causes people to change their behavior. So I'll leave that for now. Thank you. All right, I'm going to go to uh, Vice Mayor Kibi and then Council Member Hernando Savage. Um, I'll go a bit later if that's okay. Well, you can go now if you want. I mean, right? No, I prefer to wait. Thank you. All right, Robin. Yeah. Sorry, I had this new cool mouth. But uh, just a couple things. I, I just, first and foremost, I just want to thank everybody in our our transportation department, engineering, um, everybody really working together and and trying to make the city the most safest city. Um, in, in everything that we do and looking at, at all the bits and pieces and, and where we can do better. So definitely do appreciate this. I know this is something that we've been working on for a while. Um, so I, I have really had an opportunity to kind of go back through and pour through all that data again and look at all the feedback that we got from residents. And, and I, I would agree with the one gentleman that spoke that said it was about a 60-40. And I think that, you know, 60% of the individuals that um, uh, that uh, commented were the ones that did not want any change in the speed limits and 40% were the ones that supported the change in the speed limits moving forward. And, and um, again, I thank all those individuals that took the time to let us know and the ones that commented tonight. So I certainly do ap appreciate that. And like somebody said, I mean, there was over 200 comments. I mean, that's, that's pretty amazing. And I think we do a really good job of asking for community outreach. So I just wanna say thank you so much for, for all of that. Um, just just a couple of things I just kind of want to remind people too that you know we actually imp implemented the transportation master plan back in 2015 and back in 2015 we since then you know we've, we've done a lot of really great things from um, creating bike lanes on some of our major streets we've added medians to University Drive uh, we've been up implementing and working on our bus pullouts um, and since then we've even done other things to um, increase traffic calming where it is working really hard with signal timing, trying to get that right with all the new development and residents that are living in our, our community, um, doing uh, uh, widening of different uh, intersections and things to that effect that really help improve traffic flow. And a lot of those things have been done recently. So, you know, the rule in Southern, the rule in University, um, some of the dedicated turn lanes that have been implemented and the signal changes. And, and one of the things that kind of worries me too is that our data that we're collecting have now, our crash data is only through 2018. Um, so I feel like we've really implemented a lot of really good positive things in this last year that hopefully will continue that downward trajectory is what we are trying to achieve. I see one of the things that I would really love us to focus on is our traffic technology. I had an opportunity to uh, do a little tour over there in our transportation uh, building and realized one of the things that I think may be really helpful moving forward would be an investment of resources into technology and what, what we're able to do. Um, and, and I do agree too that uh, we, we've established, I think, so many different strategies in Vision Zero. I think there was like over 30 of them, if, if I remember right. And, you know, I'm just not that confident that reducing speed limits is, should be our largest first step. I think that there are things that we need to be able to get feedback on first and foremost um, to see where what we're doing. We implemented things like the uh, distracted driving ordinance just early last year. I think that's going to make a significant impact when we look at crash data and overall accidents in our city. Um, the different changes I think that we've done to control traffic over the last years and the emphasis that we've really put on that. I agree with Council Member Chin that making a change in uh, the high school districts and as long as they're on board and agree with that, I, I can certainly support that and I'm willing to do that. Uh, so I, I, I'm just not ready to go to, to this extreme right now. 
I think that we need to continue with some of the things that we are already working on. I know one of the biggest uh, things that are, is I think still pending for so many people is McClintock Road. And we haven't even taken the time to get that done like we promised. So with all those factors that I talked about and discussed, um, the one option that I will support moving forward would be option C. Thank you, Mayor. Great. Uh, thank you, Councilman Erdano Savage. Now I'm going to go to Vice Mayor Kuby and then Councilmember Adams. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So before I state my, my views, I wanted to read a letter from resident John McRae who wanted his letter read, but didn't happen. So he wrote, while I knowingly speed at times and will unfortunately be one of the first to get a speeding ticket should the speed reduction go into play, I believe strongly it's the right direction for our city. I was initially strongly against it, but after months of thought, I'm realizing the following items will occur if we do not make this change. Our main roads will become more of a replacement for the freeways when the freeways are busy. This increase in traffic will further degrade our roads. Speed-related accidents will continue at the high rate we are currently seeing. Roads will become less, less welcome to bicyclists. The following items will occur if we do safer roads, quieter roads. This is a big one that should be factored into the decision that we haven't talked about, he says. And then there's less of an incentive for overall traffic to use our roads versus a freeway system. <clears throat> okay, now I'd like to make some personal statements and, you know, and obviously advocate for this. I mean, I'm so proud of our transportation staff and they come at this with the highest ethics with a, with a commitment, an ethical commitment that they take when they become traffic engineers, and I'm very respectful of that. So last night, a 25-year-old woman lost her life in a high-speed crash in South Tempe at Elliott and Kyrene. That was in South Tempe. And last year, Patricia England, she died. She was a good friend of mine and others on the council. She died crossing the street in a wheelchair on Rural Road by the library. She's one of those points in that data dashboard that we've all seen. <clears throat> so last year, the council, we unanimously voted for Tempe to become Arizona's first Vision Zero city. We pledged to reduce traffic fatalities and serious injury crashes to zero, but to walk the talk on Vision Zero, we're now considering using a safe systems approach to setting speed limits. And specifically, it reduces speed limits by five miles an hour on most streets, and in some cases, 10 miles an hour, in the proposed plan, option A, South Tempe is still, for the most part, this is an important note, five miles per hour faster. It is faster right now. Um, rather than expecting perfect behavior from drivers, pedestrians, and bicyclists, this approach, the safe systems approach, recognizes that people are, are gonna make mistakes and systems are going to fail. But the goal, the goal is to set speed limits so that when someone errs, the penalty isn't their life. Um, our community, suffers from a traffic fatality crisis. In the past year, 69, five years, excuse me, 69 lives have been lost on Tempe streets. And the single biggest danger to Tempeans involved car crashes, vehicular speed, one in nearly four high severity crashes are speed related. Lower speed limits will reduce crash fatality rates for everyone, but especially for seniors. And you, know, you guys know I'm, I'm one, or I'm getting to be one, but seniors have the highest risk of death and injury on our roads at 40 miles per hour. Just listen to this statistic because it blows my mind. 45% of people will die if they're struck at 40 miles an hour, but 70% of those over 70 years old will die. So it's an axiom. I've said it, you've said it, we've all said it, Mr. Mayor, that council sets staff priorities. In this case, we set a goal of no more deaths or serious injuries from crashes, a serious commitment. None of us are traffic engineers, and in many ways, you know, I'm married to a, tra uh, a transportation geographer, but in a lot of ways, I don't think we should be the decision makers here. We've done four public information sessions for our residents, and they were information sessions. They were a little distinct from what we do in the past. Um, but let's make a distinction here. Should we really be asking for opinions about whether people want to be safe or not? Is public safety not our council's highest priority? I wanna remind us too that it was unanimous transportation commission decision. I've heard many cases where council members have said, this was a decision of our, our DRC or commission and we need to take their commission seriously. I take, take their, their advice seriously. This is a unanimous decision. Our transportation engineers after 
Lots of study, public education, they brought us a robust, data-driven, evidence-based, safe systems approach to not just make our streets safer, but to improve traffic flow, to alleviate congestion and reduce delay. Speed limits are not a political issue, and I really fear that we've politicized this issue. It's basic science, it's engineering, it's risk reduction on hard data. And we know for a fact that even a small change in speed Rate re re greatly reduces the severity of any crash, especially when our elderly neighbors are involved. So it's not just about reducing the injuries with, with crashes that are involving speed, but any crashes, because if it's a, if it's a, sh if it's a, sh a smaller speed, sorry, a less of a speed, there's gonna be less injury. It's like basic physics. Some people are trying to make this into a political issue because it doesn't think it affects them, but it affects us all, especially seniors. I keep saying that because I'm so aware of my advancing age. Um, but, you know, also we're seeing this increase in all modes of travel and transportation across our city. We brag about it. We say we're the 20 minute city that that we embrace alternative modes by lowering speed limits. We're, we're committing to safer roads for everyone. We're encouraging people get out and walk and bike more. We're seeing that it's a sidelight and a, a silver lining, I guess, of COVID. We're seeing people biking more and walking more and that reduces carbon emissions and takes vehicles off the road. And our roads are changing. So there's been a lot of frustration, especially in Tempe. These roads were built for the speed, and, um, but our roads are changing because we're changing. If we want safer streets for all, we need to manage that change. And lowering speed limits by five miles an hour, it's not the solution. I agree with Council Member Ardana Savage. Um, Vision Zero is about a spate, of, a spate of suggestions. And it has to be matched with enforcement. And we've recently added two enforcement officers to our squads to be able to do more enforcement and targeted enforcement, looking at the data. But changing the speed limits propels us one step closer to our vision zero goal. And that was a serious commitment that we made unanimously and then we, we, we touted the city of Tempe. So my question to council is, is, do you wanna take one of many small steps to reduce the severity of all crashes in our entire city? That's my question tonight. And as elected officials, we have a moral obligation. Our traffic engineers brought us this, brought us this after studying it for a year with Vision Zero public meetings that they held. They have a moral obligation, which they've stated. We have a moral obligation to lead on and follow through on important issues, especially as they re relate to the highest priority that we have as council members, and that's public safety. If we can save even one life by reducing speed limits, if we could have saved the life of Patricia England as she crossed over the library and rural road, well, that life will have been worth it. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, we're gonna go to Jennifer, then Councilmember Navarro. Jennifer, can you hear, can you, can you hear me, Mr. Mayor? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Um, so, so I appreciate everyone's feedback tonight, and um, it's it's been very valuable. But I also appreciate the residents that responded to uh, the questions, and we really did a great job. Transportation did a great job, Shelley, Seiler, and company, uh, with putting all this information together. And the residents don't want the speed limits to be lowered, and I just can't support lowering speed limits when our residents don't want it. Uh, we have done, as Council Member Arredondo talked about, we've done a lot of uh, things already that we've implemented a lot of measures already to uh, towards uh, our goal of zero crashes. So I am going to be comfortable with option C tonight and uh, that are, uh, and, and, and the flashing lights uh, at the school zones. I think that that'll be really helpful. Um, and that's that's where I am uh, tonight on this issue. So thanks so much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Councilman Adams. Councilman Navarro. Hey, thank you, Mayor. Um, first, I want to thank staff for and uh, staff for getting this survey out and giving the information out to the community. I think this is uh, really um, great that you got so many people involved. And um, I know we do we did our due diligence on trying to make sure that this information was conveyed out there. So I do appreciate that. Um, at the same time, being a firefighter and also um, witnessing, or not witnessing, witnessing, but, witness, but uh, seeing the after effect of many collisions, um, 
I can only say collisions come in you know, a variety of different shapes and sizes, so to speak. There's no one reason why um, certain things happen, but they do happen. Um, oftentimes, it's because of drivers either are distracted or either under the influence or they're either um, driving at reckless rates and not caring about the speed limit no matter what. Those are your deadliest. Um, minor crashes, so to speak, you know, a little um, traffic jam or hitting bumpers back and forth. And we see them often um, and on in the freeways. And often we see them at low speeds too. So once again, there, there you are looking at distraction and not understanding your, your proximity to your car in front of you and or abiding by, and I'm guilty at that sometimes, uh, the distance that you're supposed to be driving. I mean, if we all look back at, you know, taking that driver's ed class and understanding the rules of the road, we don't apply, we, we, I probably would say 80% of the time, I don't see the drivers applying those rules of the road. And the ones that do, often they might irritate another driver and that driver reacts in a different way and he might cause a collision because he's overreacting for um, selfish reasons. So it's hard to say that speed is the culprit of all this, which speed does have an effect on the outcome of a collision for sure. But to say that we need to paint the brush on the whole entire city, I can't agree with. Um, I do support, you know, school zones, the flashing lights. Um, when school's in session, I, I can get by that and the traffic goes back to normal speeds, whatever that range is. I could support the option B because of the downtown congestion uh, north of the uh, 60 or even north of Southern Road um, as a possible option to go towards. I think that's practical because of the fact that a rural road has many speed adjustments to 35 to 40. Um, and realistically, even at 35, people um, have a buffer even driving up to 40. What I feel though is if, you, if you're truly trying to make a difference in areas, um, and I've always said this along and, and I'm always about right-of-ways, is right-of-way improvement or in placing um, medians in, in areas where they can actually cause a common. We saw that and, and we had a fierce debate about it uh, on University Road when those medians were um, established. And I knew that, you know, for one thing, the speeds would calm themselves and they do because of how the road is shaped now. It's a little bit tighter. Um, there's a little more beautification with that road, which um, in my opinion adds a little bit more you know, slow down recognition and um, a lot of variables. So I think those things actually help, and there's been studies on this too, um, slow and calm the traffic down. But long and short of it is, um, you're not gonna control um, people that are gonna go out of bounds. Um, those things are gonna happen. I think, in, and I told this before, and the one thing that controlled behaviors were cameras at intersections, and that did have an impact. And we did see that impact dramatically drop in those intersections because people knew of, that, of, of those intersections and the speeds and the, the fact that you can get caught um, with a picture and a bill in the mail. But there was also some other, um, you know, pitfalls with that and the billing system and the cost and everything else that would, that applied to it. Um, but that realistically changed the speed limit. So I could support that flashing, you know, speed limit sign um, to recognize what speed you're in. But to sit here and say, I have to um, worry about every citizen and how they drive. I can't possibly do that. I also can't possibly, um, you know, save everybody in the city of Tempe. You know, I recognize at my age that, and just recently I tore my Achilles, know that my body is not in the same shape as it is. And I know that falls are going to have a bigger impact on my body. And as I get older, that is going to hold true. No matter if I'm in a car, no matter if I'm walking down a street, if I fall at 75 or 80 years old, I might have a life-threatening injury that's gonna cause my death. Not a car crash, but just a basic fall. And those things do happen considering someone's underlying health. So I cannot possibly help or, or, or understand individuals' underlying health on how they're gonna survive certain things and or not survive certain things. And I've seen people unbelievably survive certain things where I could not imagine how they survive those things. So with that being said, I, I can't possibly 
sit there and protect everybody. But I will say that I will try to support something that's reasonable. Option B, in my opinion, could be reasonable. I for sure can support option C, um, but that's a step that, I, that I'll take. Um, with that being said, I appreciate my time. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Navarro. Councilmember Keating. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I won't repeat a lot of what was said, just that, you know, I am proud that the city of Tempe is the first uh, city in Arizona to adopt Vision Zero, and we've taken several steps towards that implementation, and, um, you know, the data is not back on of those steps have been successful yet, as Councilmember Arredondo Savage pointed out. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing that and sort of reassessing the situation. Um, but I also, you know, have to agree with what Councilmember Arenado Savage said about keeping the commitments we've made before we make new commitments. And of course, you know, McClintock has sat half finished for three years and, you know, the residents of Tempe expected that to be done a while ago. So um, I'd be very, uh, I'm very hesitant to start making more promises when we haven't finished the work that we've already said that we were going to do uh, at this time. I do like option C. I think that does make sense as far as, um, you know, uh, providing some consistency during uh, hours when school is not in session and hopefully mitigating some um, congestion issues as well. So that's what I'm prepared to support tonight. Um, I do appreciate the time that staff um, did uh, went uh, gave to creating this presentation and going through uh, all the public comment and the, ex the experts that they brought in to, to help guide us here. But for now, um, I'd like to see us um, you know, finish our to-do list first before we start adding to it. And um, I will support option C tonight. Thank you very much, Mayor. Thank you, Randy. Before I, go, I see Lauren has her hand up, before I go to Vice Mayor, I, I just want to ask a question on, for staff on the criteria. Um, can you explain how you came up with the four criteria in the memo? Marilyn or? Shelly or Julian? Hi, Mayor, this is Marilyn. Um, oh, I see the under background information, the criteria that was used for the recommended yeah. changes. Yeah, I should probably let Julian talk to those. Those are uh, from uh, prior to starting the uh, Vision Zero safe uh, systems uh, analysis. Uh, go ahead, Julian. Thank you, can everybody hear me? Yep. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. Um, yes, this was back in May of 2018. This was primarily based on feedback that we had gotten from our residents and some statistical analysis that we had done in-house. So um, the 35 mile per hour high school zones, um, th they've historically been somewhat of a, um, we've gotten feedback from our community why at 2 a.m. on a Sunday, we have to change our speed and such. So we felt like it was time to take a look at that and try to address that. We, we know that um, we get better driver behavior when, when drivers know what to expect. So areas of inconsistency, inconsistency and discontinuity where the speed limit goes from 45 miles to 40 to 35 to 40 to, you know, and it changes over um, a corridor, it, it, it um, we know that it just, uh, that drivers, that driver expectancy isn't there. And as a, as a result, sometimes we get higher speeds for reasons that um, some of the council members have pointed out that they don't realize um, perhaps that they're in a different uh, speed zone. The similar is with arterial mid blocks. Um, most drivers expect that a, if the speed limit is gonna change, it's gonna change um, at the ma major mile mile intersections. And so we, um, we try to avoid locations mid block where we might uh, where that ex expectation doesn't exist. And finally, we were just looking at some of our streetscape projects and trying to get an idea of, um, do th the changes that we make have an impact on traffic? So do adding, adding landscape median islands, for example, on University and on Broadway, what effect was that having and was it reducing? And so we were taking a look at some of those. So that, that was the rationale behind uh, the four original criteria that we looked at in May of 2018. Thank you, Julian. Uh, that's good information. Thank you for that. Uh, Vice Mayor Kiwi. Yeah, just some, some responses to some of the things I heard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So 
Um, for Councilmember Adams, you said the residents of Tempe don't want this. I, I really don't think that a survey, not, and not a randomized survey, not a data-driven survey, but 200 people showing up at meetings and then 60% of that is all of Tempe. And I have to say, I attended three of the meetings, three of the four meetings. I, I don't think I saw any of you at any of the meetings, by the way. I don't mean to publicly shame you, but I didn't see other council members at the meetings. And there were a lot of quiet people there. And there were a lot of, there was a lot of, I would say the one in South Tempe was actually more even. Um, the one in North Tempe was a little bit more negative towards speed limit reduction. It was interesting. But at, at three of the meetings, there was a lot of thoughtful, considered opinions. Um, and it certainly wasn't a slam dunk for one side or the other in, in any of those meetings. Um, Randy, you talk about the cost, of, you know, the cost of the options and we shouldn't be probably spending money when we haven't done McClintock. Well, most of the cost comes from putting the flashing lights in the schools, which I totally support, by the way. But most of the cost comes from that. We have our own sign shop, so it's not as if this is a big cost to the city. And, um, and Randy, I remember last meeting at Valvoline, when we were talking about Valvoline, you gave an impassioned speech, and you talked about there's times where you have to be a leader, that you have to show leadership. And, and I would say put on your big leadership pants, and you have to do you know, what's right. And this is one of those instances. And you know, I have to say that we thank staff, and we're so good at every public presentation about thanking staff, yet we ignore their best data-driven work. We, we vote unanimously for an audacious, important goal, that of a functional zero for fatalities or serious inju injury crashes. We vote unanimously for vision zero to save lives, but we don't choose to enact what is an important part of vision zero. We praise our commissions. I recall um, when we talked about the Roosevelt House, Councilmember Member Donna Savage, you mentioned that we have to really, uh, or Randy, I think it was, we have to really respect the decisions our commissions make but then we're ignoring the best advice of the Transportation Commission. We rely on transportation staff and our Transportation Commission to be our subject matter experts. But you know, it's a special kind of arrogance to assume that we somehow can interpret the data better than they can. And I really think that this is you know, a bad decision that we're making if we decide not to move forward. I would support option B. I would support option B and then looking six months in a year and seeing if it's working. And, and, being that, that city on a hill that wants to innovate and test and percolate. Let's see if it works. We know we're not going to hurt someone by doing it. We might just save a life. So why don't we do option B and look to see if it, if it works, try whatever the traffic engineers say, if they need six months, a year, two years, and then we can go back and look at the date and say yes or no and make a decision about trying to advance it to South Tempe or trying to um, turn back the clock and, and, and take it away from North Tempe. But you know, I think we, we, have, we, have a, we have a leadership question here, and, and I'm really hoping that we'll at least go with option B tonight and, and vote, not vote, but advance it to a future formal council meeting. Thank you, uh, Vice Mayor Kiwi. I think it sounds like from the consensus, and I'm with this uh, item, which is alternate C, uh, if that's the will of the council, um, we look to move forward. Um, let me see here. Uh, Council Member Keating, do you have your hand up or no? Yeah, Mayor, I did. Okay. Can I go? Yes, yes. Yeah, I just want to point out I didn't mention the cost at all. I didn't, that was not a factor. That's not a, something that came out of my mouth during my remarks. Um, I'd also like to say that Patricia Edwards was a good friend of mine as well. Um, but, you know, my position is not going to change on this. Thank you. All right. Yeah, sorry, I mispronounced, I misstated her last name. It's in nervousness. I'm very emotional about this issue, folks. You can probably hear it in my voice, and I made a mistake. But you were mentioning about, you know, we haven't done the Clint talk. So to put our emphasis on this, it is going to have a cost. So um, that's but where I didn't I didn't say the word cost. I just pointed out that McClintock's been halfway done for three years and it's upsetting to me. I did, did not mention yeah. a dollar amount. Council member uh, Hernando Savage. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Really quick. I just I just want to concur with uh, Council Member Keating in the sense that I'm, I'm very comfortable with C. I like to move forward with C. Um, I do appreciate the work and information. And um, I just want to say, too, I think it's really important that as leaders in this community that we continue to respect each other. We're seven individual council members and a mayor. 
that does their homework, gets the information, dissects the data, and then makes the best decision possible. And I would call this definitely public shaming. And I think it's really disappointing. I think it's very important that we continue to be professional and respect each other's opinion, even though we don't always agree. So Mayor, I would like to move forward with option C. Thank you. All righty. I think the consensus is to move forward with option C. Again, thank you to staff and to all the residents that participated um, in all the public discussions. My cat is talking to me. Okay, with that, we're going to move on. We're going to move to the next item on our agenda is a Parks and Recreation Master Plan update. And we're going to move forward, uh, I think, I believe Keith Burke, Craig Hayton, and Leslie Dornfield. I think I'm going to hand it off to Keith. Keith, are you there? Mayor Council, it's Craig Hayton, Parks and Recreation, Deputy Community Services Director. Um, Sean Wagner and I are going to present here tonight. I've just loaded up the presentation. And uh, Sean is going to kick it off. Our consultant is with us here tonight um, on the phone, but Sean and I will be presenting. Sean, you there? Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Perfect. Thank you, Craig. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, as Craig mentioned, he and I will be uh, providing an update on the Parks and Recreation Master Plan this evening. And our uh, consultant, Leslie Dornfield, is online with us as well to, to help answer any questions that may come up. As you may recall, back in December 2019, we introduced uh, planning efforts and the process, including initial public outreach efforts for this plan. Um, this outreach included multiple focus groups as well as a, a community survey that received over 1,800 responses. Uh, since that time, city staff have continued to work with the plan's consultant, Planet uh, Communities, to develop a system-wide community involvement planning approach to evaluate our parks and recreation amenities, facilities, events, and programs. Ultimately, uh, developing a community-driven goals and strategies uh, that will shape our service delivery over the next 10 years. In light of the recent pandemic, staff is working with Planet Communities to ensure that recommendations for resiliency planning are incorporated into future recommendations to reduce risk and also uh, support response activities as we grapple with our community's emphasis on public health and recovery. Next slide. While Parks and Recreation, <laughs> while this plan, the Parks and Recreation Master Plan supports all of the council strategic priorities, it primarily impacts qual our quality of life priority measures 3.16, the satisfaction with parks and recreation facilities, and 3.17, the satisfaction with the quality of community services programs. Next slide. This presentation will include updates on three deliverables from the planning, pro the planning process. The first is the recreation program assessment. Next, we'll talk about the levels of service analysis and then the park classification. Craig is also going to be providing an update on an innovative plan format that actually engages and enhances the overall user experience. Uh, we're really excited about this. Lastly, we'll discuss our next steps, including our timeline. There will definitely be an opportunity for questions and additional input at the end, but if at any time during this presentation you'd like additional clarification or have some comments, please get our attention and we'll be happy to discuss it with you. Next slide. Planet Communities assessed our current recreation programs, which resulted in recommendations for future program service delivery. Uh, public input was gathered through survey instruments, as well as focus groups with different stakeholders. An inventory of existing programs uh, was analyzed and compared to a variety of benchmarks uh, and national trends. In order to create this uh, program plan over the next five to 10 years, it's critical uh, that we as a park and recreation division uh, identify our role in providing quality of life services to our community. Planet Communities categorize the division's current focus on programs into high, medium, and, and limited areas. These focus areas, uh, keep in mind, they, they don't indicate the overall importance, rather the, the current role of the division in providing these programs through its allocation of resources. High focus programs primarily um, are the primary responsibility of our division with a significant investment in both program, programs through staff and resources. Uh, examples of these things are sports, aquatics, adaptive recreation, and special events. Medium-focused programs um, 
we share responsibility in providing these programs to the community with other organizations. These programs typically share costs in this case. So uh, examples in this uh, area would be our fitness and wellness classes, as well as our general hobbies and interest, uh, our community interest uh, type classes, where we have a host of different internal as well as external service providers. And then lastly, we have our limited focus. And the, in this case, uh, the division will provide some support through facilities and promotion, uh, but we don't have that significant uh, financial or logistical requirements um, with these particular programs. Moving forward, staff are gonna continue to work with the community uh, through additional planning and assessment to reallocate resources to those areas that align with our city's values. In some cases, these programs will require an enhancement of resources, while in others, uh, we'll look to either maintain or support uh, our involvement through collaboration. Next slide. Planet Communities is recommending the following strategies to ensure recreation programming reaches its full potential in Tempe. The first is to develop an additional framework uh, for providing recreation programs and services to our citizens. Uh, here we want to refine our philosophy and plans for our program and service delivery. This will include identifying priorities for development, uh, determining the role that our organization as well as other organizations play in providing uh, recreation in our area, and then also identifying areas so that we're not duplicating resources. Uh, next, we wanna to continue to develop a broad range of recreation programs and services that meet the, uh, or that serve the needs of the entire community. Here, we wanna make sure we're, we're tracking trends on a regional and national basis. Uh, we're also gonna to wanna to make sure that these reflect the opportunities that are valuable to our community. In this case, we really need to focus on those programs and services that respond to different cultural segments of our community we need to focus on multi-generational and intergenerational opportunities and really bring a diverse community together. Uh, through this, we'll establish and grow partnerships with other organizations and entities, for this is not done in a silo or a vacuum. It's definitely going to be a community effort as we continue to develop and expand our recreation programs. Uh, we'll also want to uh, establish some stronger administrative procedures uh, for our programming. One such way to do this is uh, the life cycle here on, your, uh, on the right-hand side is this is a life cycle analysis for programs and we should be continuing to track all of our programs and it's so that they're reviewed on a seasonal basis to determine where they're at within this program life cycle so that we can either devote more resources if that's something that's required or in some cases sunset programs that have maybe um, served their purpose and then we could reallocate to provide some of uh, those services that meet those new and upcoming trends. We'll also want to develop a um, comprehensive and just a, a really robust marketing and outreach plan uh, with an emphasis on our programs and services. We're really gonna need to establish a division, uh, vision here with uh, specific annual deliverables. Uh, and this again will be done with the community in mind and involved. So we're really gonna wanna continue to touch base uh, with, our, with our communities through focus groups, surveys, stakeholder interviews. Um, again, a really exciting piece about this is really bringing in that community engagement to our service delivery. So now moving forward, Craig is gonna discuss um, the levels of service and the other items that we have to present tonight. Thanks, Sean, and my apologies for the slow slide uh, transitions here, my computers uh, participating well with me, but thank you, Sean, and good evening, Mayor and Council. As now we transition into another key deliverable, this stage of the planning process, um, our consultant has put together with our, made some recommendations um, to our committee and uh, really would love to walk you through what one of those key pieces is, which is the level of service analysis. I'm gonna start by defining what it is, talk a little bit about why it's important, how it's formulated before going on to the next couple slides um, to show how an analysis is actually performed um, before really showing at a high level some of the recommendations for some of the park amenities. So at a high level, um, a level of service analysis really is that mechanism to evaluate the number of facilities and amenities within a park and recreational system. And this really helps us evaluate our capacity to meet our future needs. So our current analysis usually is performed as a ratio of an amenity to a segment of population. So if we say we have 0.32 dog parks, as we'll see on the following slide, per every 10,000 uh, people within Tempe, that 0.32 is a ratio that carries forward as we increase population that shows that we have the need to add potentially additional amenities 
um, as our population grows just to provide the same level of service. And this really helps us as that evaluation tool to identify those gaps in service, recommends quantity of new facilities over additional facilities, but then ultimately guides our infrastructure investments, what it's gonna to take to maintain things, but also our potential for additional programming in the future. And for this next slide, I'm gonna move into, if my computer actually helps here, all right, how this actually is performed. A level of service analysis uses two key, two, two key steps. On the left-hand side, we have a benchmark jurisdiction, um, which is utilized to produce that apples to apples, ratio to ratio comparison. As we can see on the far left side of that left chart, Tempe has 0.32 dog parks, and this is a dog park example, per 10,000 people. We have currently six, we have 190,000 people. When we do the math, we have 0.32. We then get a chance to compare ourselves and how many um, dog parks as a ratio we have compared to other jurisdictions nationally. And we have selected through our consultant planet community six different jurisdictions that you can see is really all over the place um, in the dog parks that they report in a ratio of dog parks per 10,000 people. So we've utilized six different jurisdictions that have some commonality with MP, understanding that no one jurisdiction is a perfect match for another. And just from this visual, we can see on the low end that Anaheim has 0 0.06, dog parks per 10,000, uh, Chula Vista has 0.37, and then there are also some that have reported that they don't have any, or they may not have some dog parks. So we use that, then on the far right-hand side of that chart, we can see the median and the average, and we have an opportunity to really compare that ratio against the median average and even some of the in-between numbers in there. Um, but that is not all we use and our consultant is used to make recommendations. We also use that public survey input that we received last year. As Sean mentioned, we had over 1,800 public survey responses. So for dog parks, looking at the data, we know that 35% of folks who answered the questions or who took the survey said that they utilize dog parks. 32% of survey respondents overall so that we could do with more dog parks within 10 p So a relatively high response for both of those. That coupled with the benchmark jurisdiction analysis really helps us gauge a recommendation. I'm pulling forward from the previous slide, the right-hand side of this slide, which is that um, analysis of a ratio of um, dog parks per 10,000. But the chart on the left-hand side is really the nuts and bolts of what our options are. The very far left-hand side on that column level of service identifies that we really have three options. We can go with our current level of service, um, which is 0.32, we can use the median, which is the dark gray, um, as shown on the right-hand side of the chart uh, on the right, which is 0 0.10. And then the average we could go with as well, which is 0 0.10. For both of those, we would actually be dropping our level of service down, which then as our population increases, doesn't really show a need for additional dog parks. Um, our consultant backed by the support of our um, core team has supported the current level of service for dog parks, which shows as our population increases over the next three decades, just to keep up with our current level of service, we will need to add additional dog parks. And that's how um, utilizing the information from the um, jurisdictional um, input that we have and then the public survey information, we can actually make a call. We, we could actually lower it off of lower than our current level of service and not go with the median or average or actually raise it up if we so choose. So we get to set our own um, course for our amenities moving forward. And then the next slide is just gonna show an overall look at different amenities. This isn't a, a complete look at all of the amenities that we looked at for the level of service, but um, in order to have a, a visual slide that we could look at, um, we have put um, a dozen or so amenities on this slide here. So looking at the blue portion of the slide on the left from left to right, we have our the type of facility or amenity. I've highlighted dog parks because we've already talked about one, that one and it's familiar. We have six, the second column, six currently within our inventory. The recommended level of service is to keep it the same at 0.32. So that is what we currently have. Therefore, when we use that level of service, the total needed, the adjusted amount in 2020 is six because we keep the same level of service. Currently, we don't have to add any more to keep our current level of service, but as population grows over the next 10 years and we go from potentially 190,000 to 217, we should add one more dog park um, over the next decade just to keep up with our current level of service. And as you can see on that far right-hand column moving down, there's the potential to add new amenities in various forms, um, the largest number being picnic ramadas. There's the potential to add six new playgrounds, 
um, additional volleyball courts, pickleball, skate parks, those amenities. And it's important to know, and we had a great conversation at the Neighborhood Advisory Commission last night on just because we've identified additional amenities, it doesn't mean that we have to build new, but we can look for potential partnerships with school districts. Um, we already use school districts, some of their sites for tennis courts. So we already have some potential. Um, we can use private development potentially to build some amenities that we that could be open to the public. So just by identifying a number um, doesn't mean that we have to build something, but it does look, it does provide an opportunity for us really to add uh, an, a recreational amenity and an opportunity to our public. So. I'd love to stop here. If there's any questions um, of what we've presented so far with the level of service before we move on to park classifications, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Craig. Um, I can only say, I mean, a lot has changed since the last time we did a master plan for our parks. And, and I know we've added like a scare park along with uh, Rio Salado parks and the North Tempe Multi-Gen Center. Um, and the efforts that you and your staff have come forward is really helping create the future of our city that I know a lot of cities that surround us are envy of that. I mean, if you just take your iPhone or your iPad or even your uh, cell phone and look at a map, we have a park every square mile. Um, and that's unheard of, but what this comes forward, this is really tremendous. Is there any comments or discussion from the council on this item on the parks master plan update? Uh, Councilman uh, Aradano Savage. Robin, you there? Are you trying to unmute? Yeah, I'm just talking to myself. Okay. Uh, yes, I just want to say thanks to the team and all the work and things that you guys have been doing. Um, really do appreciate it. I think that uh, we are experiencing some unprecedented times and, and you guys have really risen uh, to the level and uh, the professionals have been outstanding. I think this is going to be a really great tool for us moving forward. You know, my only thought is, is now that things have changed, do you feel like you kind of need to look through things with a different lens a little bit and what that might look like moving forward? And I just want to make sure too that regarding the timeline of completion that you don't feel like there's any pressure. I just think that, like I said, these are really unprecedented times. I want to make sure you're all comfortable with you know, any, any expectations of what's to come in the future. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Thank you, Member. Uh, Robin, I'm gonna go to uh, Councilman Navarro, then Vice Mayor Kiwi. And, and Mayor, I'm sorry, we do have additional stuff as well, so. Okay. Just wanted to pause here, but thank yep. you. <laughs> you know, Mayor, I, I just, uh, I'm gonna hold off until they're done. Sorry about that, did not know. Okay, Lauren, do you wanna hold off? I didn't, I thought, I should have looked. Okay. Sure, sure, I'll hold off, no problem. Okay, go ahead, Craig, sorry. Thank you, Mayor, my apologies for that. All right, moving on to our park classification update, another key component that really ties well to the level of services, our opportunity to look at how we classify open spaces and areas that we recreate within Tempe. Um, park classification update, as you mentioned, Mayor, has not been, we've not looked at this planning effort since 2001 and so much has changed, so this is really a key piece. Um, and a classification, park classification system really is that system of defining and organizing those different spaces. We use the same level of service jurisdiction. They have some definition for park spaces within there. And there's really three key ways that we can determine a park's classification. We can look at the number and amount or type of a facility or amenities to drive the park classification. We can look at the service area that the radius that we expect people to travel within to an area or we can look at the overall size of a space as well to help drive that. We have um, at the recommendation of our consultant and we've agreed that we believe that facilities and amenities, the type and scale of them, a number of them really should drive a parks classification. And ultimately this ties back to the level of service which would guide the potential for future amenities and facility types and scales. And then also has some secondary benefits that impacts maintenance standards what we could potentially program. And again, really tying back to one of those ways that we can analyze um, how far would we expect somebody to travel to utilize an amenity and that, that part classification, though it's something that most people don't tend to think of, really has that opportunity to inform within this, um, this park update. So I'm gonna highlight on this next slide, just what is similar and what we're recommending changing for the 2020 plan versus 20, 2001. So 
above that horizontal white line on the left hand side of the slide, we can see that regional parks, community parks, neighborhood parks, these are classifications that will carry forward a name. But as we can see on the bottom left, many parks are a classification that we're no longer recommending. And the other, which was a very big catch all, is something that we would love to address a name to. So we're looking at urban parks as a new park classification. That's something we're very excited about for areas that are high density, low space, don't have to be on city property, could potentially be on private development areas, um, mostly north of Broadway, especially in our urban core. Um, we look in, we're looking at adding natural areas. We have two desert preserves in the Indian Ben Wash habitat that have come online since 2001, shared use recreation facilities. These are areas where we have agreements um, for recreational use, or we have some responsibility for an amenity like school districts with tennis courts and sports fields. And then finally, we have kind of a, still a general category in special use, the Double Butte Cemetery, Diablo Stadium, golf courses, sports complex, and those sorts of things. So those are some of the changes from 01 to 2020, but we also are looking at really making the community park classification a bit more robust. Um, back in 2001, there were only a couple um, community parks identified, Escalante, Daly Park, and Clark Park. We believe, because we know that those are still neighborhood at their core, but they serve a larger service area based on their amenities that they hold, that there is the opportunity um, to relook at our parks some, even some of the neighborhood parks and, and see if they're better classified as community parks based on some of the amenities. JC Park is one that really comes to mind as it has a recreation center, lit sports field, restrooms, and those sorts of things. We had a great conversation at the Neighborhood Advisory Commission last night about what some of those impacts and uh, would possibly be, um, but we anticipate having a really good discussion, um, especially as we seek some public comment um, here this, uh, this summer um, around this and the level of service. But we think there's an opportunity there that there are amenities based on the type or the amount of them that do serve an area larger than that neighborhood alone. But we know that the neighborhood is so key to each and every park that is listed on here, even if they're community parks. So that's a key piece that we're recommending that we're supporting um, so far for this planning effort as we move into um, drafting the plan from here. So I'll now move on to the last couple slides. Um, Sean mentioned we're really excited that the plan format that um, Planet Communities at Leslie and Christiane are working so hard with Stephanie Dietrich and William Mancini from our GIS team. We're really excited with this final plan um, format to be a GIS story map. It's not going to just be something that will be 300 pages that will sit on a shelf as a printed form, but something that is interactive, highly interactive, online and explorable guide. If somebody wants to print it out, they certainly can. But we believe that there is an opportunity through GIS to tell our story through maps, text, media. We believe that this is not just going to be something that staff will utilize, but we believe that it's going to be something that the public will go to. The bottom right hand side of the slide, I didn't want to try and pull in something that was a live, a virtual kind of dry run of, of this draft plan from just a formatting perspective. But if, if somebody wants to scroll in on the bottom right of the slide, if they get to that page when they're looking at the plan, they can highlight a park and see where it is and see what amenities are in that park. And that's not something that we would have had previously available to us, but based on the partnership between Planet and our GIS team, we believe is gonna be a reality moving forward. So we're really excited about this. It's gonna be a lot less verbose and a lot more um, intuitive in how it's, you can move through it. There's a table of contents still that'll take you to the right section, but we know it's something that we're extremely important, extremely excited about. Um, moving forward as we draft the plan, really getting into the nuts and bolts of what it could potentially look like. Which then leads us to where we're at from a timeline perspective. Um, everything on the left-hand side of the slide is now something that we've completed, all of the green and the orange, and we're looking at sitting in summer 2020. We certainly don't want to rush through this planning effort, but we also are really um, excited to come together with, with a draft plan for mayor and council, for the public, for boards and commissions in the fall. Um, understanding that there is so much that could potentially change even by then. Um, but we're really, really excited about this final format. Um, we have some work still to do through our, our consultant team, um, but we are really excited for, for coming together to actually put this, um, this draft plan to seek some comments um, and then implement the plan really uh, you know, moving forward, understanding this is a new decade, this is a new opportunity for us as a parks and recreation team. So I'd be happy Sean and I would be happy to have any questions. We have Leslie on the 
the phone with us as well. If there are any any questions, we'd be happy to take questions or comments at this point and, and go back to any slides if there are any specific. Great, thanks, Craig. Um, Councilman Navarro, and then we're gonna go to, um, or I'm sorry, Councilman Arredondo Savage, and then Councilman Navarro, and then Vice Mayor Kiwi. And then after Vice Mayor Kiwi, we're gonna have uh, Jennifer Adams. Hey, thanks, Mayor, really quick. I, I guess I just wanted to reiterate what I was saying before. Sorry about that, Craig, didn't mean to cut you guys off, but you know, just maybe a little bit more discussion about the timeline and your comfortability in regards to moving forward and just not feel like that has to be that way if you guys have a recommendation back towards us I'm certainly opening to hear that and making sure you guys have the time and the ability uh, to do what you you need to do to get it right thank you appreciate that support uh councilman navarro yeah thanks mark um i just want to tell you craig and, and, and staff that um and sean that this is great information a good um calendar of, of how we can handle things and, and what we can project um, in the future and, and the opportunities that we have uh, for our uh, citizens out there to enhance and uh, to enjoy what we have over there in all of our parks. So I just want to say thanks on that. And, and I also want to reiterate, um, you know, we always will have opportunities when things make sense, you know, to take advantage of, of certain things faster than other things. You know, I, I think you guys have a gauge on that um, via the volleyball courts, basketball courts, wherever it's at. Um, if we have an opportunity to cut those costs, um, those are those are just great wins for us to enhance our area. I know in and around the lake we have that opportunity, and hopefully that's still in the uh, uh, pot to get done. Uh, other than that, it's great. I have always had one question, and I don't know if we can do this, Mayor. If, if possibly we can move Hollis Park to um, over to where Hudson is, and Hudson over to Hollis or the school. I have never knew why. I always get confused with Paulus and Hudson and Hudson School right next to each other, but maybe someone can make help me understand why those are named in those areas. If you do I, I will have to, because this is just an update, Professor Navarro, I think you could talk to staff after the meeting or offline. Uh, Vice Mayor Kiwi and then Councilmember Adams. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Craig. Thank you for um, your tremendous work and professionalism and expertise. I really um, appreciate it. It's, it's throughout the document, the extent of work you've done. I have two questions. And one is I'm um, just an expectation uh, that equity in action and, and the groups that we work with will be involved in getting a chance to review the plans. Thanks, Vice Mayor. We have Janae Harrison as part of our core team, so we'll make sure that, um, that we'll connect and, and see what that specifically looks like. But she is a, a core team or a one of our committee members, um, especially as we look at drafting the plan to make sure that we get input from the right sources moving forward. So absolutely, thank you. Thank you so much about that. And then, uh, you know, representing the animal welfare uh, working group, you know, I understand that we're pretty well represented with dog parks. It's almost disappointing to know that. But one thing we, we don't have, and 30% of the residents in your survey did say they wanted it, is some kind of a water feature. Not a, I mean, a splash playground would be too expensive. And there's opportunities um, out there that we could look at that wouldn't be as, you know, that expensive. But how, how can we afford the idea of, a, um, of some kind of a water feature that dogs could use? Yeah, great point, Vice Mayor. And that was something that um, we had identified on that level of service slide. And so it's it's definitely forefront of our minds, understanding that that is, um, we have opportunities not necessarily to build something new, but potentially even a retrofit something that already exists or potentially that additional dog park. And if we have a desire to put more out over the next 10 years that we could look at um, ensuring that it does have more than what is considered as a traditional dog park. But certainly that is something that um, we've been talking with with Leslie about that we've got on the forefront of our mind for sure. Thanks, and just to say that Sing Meadows has a beautiful pond that's been restored to its pristine state, and um, that might be worth consideration. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vice Mayor. All right, Council Member uh, Jennifer Adams. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I. Uh, I wanted to tell you that I thought that the presentation was excellent and thanks to the staff for, for that presentation. 
I would like to see more dog parks. I know that our our proposal is just to add one more, and I would like to see more dog parks. And that's my that's my two cents on um, for the dogs. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilmember Adams. And and part of the level of services we do get to set our own expectations. So that's that's great feedback. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much for that. Anybody else have any questions? Uh, Councilmember Keating. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor. Uh, yeah, I just want to second uh, Councilmember Adams's call for more dog parks. I know that we're well represented, um, but to me, it seems like a dog park. And, and look, I don't know. I, please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, a dog park really isn't a cost prohibitive uh, amenity to add to really any park. It's just kind of like a fence, right? And maybe a, a water fountain. So wherever we can, if we could increase the number of dog parks throughout the city, I think that'd be good. And it's things that it's something that is popular with our residents. So that's just kind of my two cents. Um, otherwise, great presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, great plan. Thank you for putting this together. And I look forward to seeing it implemented. Thank you, council member. All right. Well, again, thank you, Craig, uh, Sean, and, and Keith Burke, and everybody in uh, community services and parks. Uh, really is a great presentation. And we're very fortunate what we do have. I always refer to them as a, as a tremendous asset, especially for selling the city in terms of quality of life. So thank you so much for that. Um, and obviously, you can put a lot of more dog parks, more pickleball courts, more softball fields, you name it, volleyball courts. Uh, but it's, uh, we're, we're lucky with the assets we have. Challenge is maintaining them, those assets. Um, at the same time, though, we continue to provide that level of service that our residents expect from us. So with that, if there's no future, any other comments, I am going to go to future agenda items. Um, it's, I, does any council member have a future agenda item? I think, uh, Councilmember Keating, I think you do. Yes, Mayor, I do. Thank you. Um, going back to our previous discussion, you know, I want to know what's going on with uh, the McClintock project. Um, uh, it was an issue in my first campaign. It was an issue in my second campaign. Um, you know, we gave direction three years ago to to add a third lane while maintaining uh, the the buffered bike lane, and the ease, the restriping was done almost immediately, and then it's sat stagnant for years without any sort of explanation, no update, nothing. So I would like to know what went wrong, uh, what was tried and apparently failed and, and what's being done to move that forward and some sort of plan to get that done uh, with all deliberate speed because it's been a long time. And again, like I, I would like to see us complete some of our, of our to-do list before we, we add to it. So an update on McClintock from staff would be much appreciated. Uh, hey, re real quick, before we go there, I get, before we go back to the next future agenda item, I made a mistake. I didn't see Lauren's hand up. Um, if Craig, uh, hopefully we can get Craig back on. Uh, sorry. Excuse me. Oh, sorry. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to add that I didn't realize there'd be so much support for um, in dog parks. And so I would like to add my voice to the, uh, my fellow committee members on the animal welfare group, because we do hear a lot from residents on this issue. I especially am keen on a, a water feature, but I um, just wanted to, to, uh, to um, agree and echo the sentiments of Councilmember Keating and, and Adams. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Councilmember Noted. All right, thank you, Craig. Thank you, thank you, Lauren. sorry about that. All right, uh, Councilmember Adams, I think you were trying to talk. Uh, support Randy's uh, future agenda item. Okay. I, I, I would like to know what's happening to on McClintock. All right. Any other council members have any future agenda items? Yes, Mr. Mayor, I do. It's uh, Lauren. So um, back in November 2017, I went to uh, the National League of Cities meeting. It's often a place where we hear good ideas and just see demonstrations of of really innovative ideas. And it was about a, a better and improved council communicator product. So I know there's been some research done, but we, we've kind of lost our way a little bit. And Lord knows we have a lot of really important issues we're dealing with, but we've been, we've seen squarely how we need that issue. Like we have people who write in about a specific issue and let's even say it's McClintock bike lanes. Um, then with a, a more refined, more updated, better software, 
it would be able to search the database and, and, and be able to email people updates from people that wrote two or three years ago about it. And I see it now with COVID, with people writing specifically about one issue. Let's say it's pickleball courts. When are they going to be open? The, we'll open the pickleball courts and we'll tell people from then on in, but we've kind of lost the people that wrote to us a month ago saying, I think it's ridiculous that you close. I mean, it, it allows for a dynamic process where we can engage more with our residents. And we know in the next who knows how long, it might be a little bit more, more difficult engaging with our residents. And this provides a better way. I, mean, I, I know I don't have to give a reasoning for it because we already had the council approval to go forward. Um, but I would like to get an update on where we are with that project. It doesn't have to be immediate, but I would like to see an update on it expanded and enhanced and better council communicator product. Okay, thank you. With that, we're gonna to go to the next item on our agenda. It's, our, it's gonna be a call to the audience for the committee of the whole. I look to our city clerk, if we have any members of the public wishing to address us under items under committee of the whole. Mayor, we have no submissions for Committee of the Whole. All right, thank you, uh, Madam Clerk. Uh, on items for new direction, we don't have any, and or for council direction, we don't have any, and new direction, new items, we don't have any. Any uh, updates on items in progress for any of the council members? Seeing none. Our next meeting, uh, well, first uh, announcements, I just want to, uh, thank again our staff for all the work you're doing through the COVID uh, crisis that we've had. Um, and and, and a th thoughts and prayers also go out to George Floyd and his family and the community. And Mr. Manager, do you have any announcements? Nothing further. Thank you, Mayor. All right. With that, our next meeting is June 18th, 2020. With that, we're adjourned. Thank you all very much.